hello internet I must tell you I'm excited again and everybody laugh at me when I say that even you I know but you know what it's a funny thing happening in the background because when I say I'm not excited why well, don't say I'm excited the guy on the other side look at me like this like man why, why are you not excited to speak to me so so we stuck to that now but I am actually excited because uh, I have a fellow here in front of me a major an officer and guess what he's also here in the east so we won't have problems with internet or ESCOM. That's really, really nice. He's in Taiwan. I mean, uh, Thailand. Uh, he was in a military academy. He was at one stage a second in command of a, of a battalion at the um, Cape Collet Corps. We need to speak about that corps as well, sir, because I've heard that uh, there was a problem with one platoon where apparently on a bad leadership ran away. I've heard such rumors, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but you can defend the honor. I understand his commanding officer, and yeah, I have to say, poor you, was one Saki Marie at one stage, and you guys who don't remember the RSM of the Parachute Battalion who became an officer, excellent operator, excellent man. Go and look at this video. There's only one Saki Marie in the world. I see the other day somebody made a comment who said he doesn't like this video of Saki Mare because it's a bit arrogant, there's no humbleness. Man, I've never seen a humble paratrooper in my life. <laughs> they don't <laughs> exist, man. Uh, you must wake up to that fact. And Saki Mare, Saki Mare, love him or leave him, but uh, don't take him on. <laughs> he will sort you out, yeah. even at his age. So, Major, you're so welcome here, sir. Thank you. And and I want to tell to all of you guys, he contacted me. He just wrote me a letter and said, Chris, I want to speak to you. It's not hard, guys. Just get hold of me. We will talk to you. If you can't speak more Afrikaans that properly, then Andrew Whitaker will take care of you. We speak English deliciously, better than us. Uh, but we are trying. So, Major, thank you so much. Uh, welcome here. And, and can I ask you, where did this start for you? How did you end up in the Army? Um, Chris, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be uh, on this channel. It's, uh, it's really wonderful. Um, I've been thinking for a while now to, to get onto the channel. Um, I've been watching uh, the shows from the beginning and um, it really brought back, back a lot of memories. And um, actually every week or you know, every now and then when a new one comes out, um, it is with a lot of enthusiasm that I uh, listen to the guys and um, you know, experience the, what they experience through their eyes and, and their experiences. So um, I just decided um, I want to share my experience too. So um, maybe I can just start at the beginning. Um, I was um, born at um, uh, on a farm in Leidenburg in the eastern Transvaal um, many, many years ago, 1958. And then um, my father was a, a railway police officer. And he ended up um, at a small station in Western Transvaal called Kukumur Station in Stolfontein. And there we lived um, for, uh, I think, seven to eight years. And um, I, it's like a mine town, you know. Um, we um, lived between the mine dumps and as kids, that's what we did, climb the mine dumps and Anyway, um, uh, he was transferred because he was a, a police officer. They were transferred a lot. And as family, we always had to just follow. And um, he was then at, at some stage transferred to um, Potschofstroom. Uh, there I attended uh, folk school Potschofstroom for uh, two years. And then finally, he was transferred to Germiston. Uh, and then I matriculated in uh, Gotrev War School um, in Primrose. And that's when um, I think where we, um, as all young uh, youngsters, uh, those days got we got our call up papers. Um, the year you turned um, eighteen, or just you know a few months before, and um, I was called up to um, three SAI Infantry Battalion in Pochostrum. Um I was very happy to go there because, firstly, it wasn't very far from my parents. House, it was just about a uh, hundred kilometers away, and also because um, I was familiar with Pochestrum because uh, that is where I lived for a number of years, so um, I I was quite happy to go there. But um, uh, I arrived, you know, the normal way by train and the shouting corporals and um, the way everybody uh, start the army days, 
and uh, you know the first few days um the the customary haircuts and going to the quartermaster store a quartermaster store and uh, draw your equipment and um, i still remember you know for me that something that will always stay by me is the is the fact that you know you you just walk by the person in the quartermaster master store and they will just look at you. You don't have the chance to fit clothes. They just look at you and say, here's your pants. Here's your shoes. And you just, you like go through it like a, like an assembly line and you just grab your trauma and you go and you, 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 you um, put on the clothes and, and that's it. And I still remember my pants were too big. My shoes, my boots were too big, but you just have, have to make do with it. That was, was part of, of, of army life. You had to, just um, adjust and that was it. Um, so we were, um, you know, uh, divided into bungalows. I think those days the bungalows had about 22 uh, troops in a bungalow. Um, and um, within the first few weeks, we had the um, selection coming from um, the, the, the people coming from infantry school and the various groups, uh, dog unit and all the various units visiting us to sort of get people to, to join uh, the different um, schools or infantry units. And long story short, um, I did the infantry school selection course there. And uh, I was chosen to go to infantry school. And in March of 1977, um, uh, we left uh, for uh, infantry school. Um, I arrived at infantry school and um, there um, my uh, company commander was um, Major Henny Schultz, um, later became a general, a very well-known officer in the Defense Force. Um, my company commander was a Sergeant Major uh, Liebenberg, Lieb Liebenberg. He was a very funny guy with a very big mustache like all Sergeant Majors, all real Sergeant Majors have. And um, the officer commanding those days uh, was uh, General or Colonel then Vitko Badenors. And I cannot remember the name of the RSM, but some of the other company commanders, I still remember um, uh, Dion Ferreira, who later became involved in 3-2 uh, Battalion. He was a, a company commander at um, uh, the Bravo Company, which used to be the, the teacher's company. Because, you know... Um, most most of us were normal national servicemen that just left school, but there was always a company where all the teachers that just qualified as teachers, as, uh, they went to Bravo Company because they were in a separate company because they were a little bit um, different from us. They were more mature and they were like um, three or four years older. So they were in, in Bravo com Company. Anyway, I was... Um, in a golf com company, um, we uh, had uh, five platoons. Um, we started training again. We did the uh, whole basics again. Um, my uh, uh, platoon sergeant, I remember very well, was um, uh, Corporal Tines van Staden. And um, he was a legend in infantry school, a very, very tough person and um, uh, you know he he chased us ar around a lot so golf company was a was a, a, a special company in the sense that uh, we only uh, got trained for um, up to uh, I think August of that year and uh, then the company was basically disbanded and we were um, uh, dealt into different other uh, companies but um, before that, you know, we did the, the normal training, um, uh, section leaders. Uh, I still remember we went to Kamanasi and dug our trenches. And, um, um, you know, uh, the, the training area in Oatzone is, is unique in the sense that the summers are very hot. Uh, the winters are very cold. And we did the section leaders training um, in the winter. And um, then at some stage, uh, you know, it would rain. You have the Otuniquas and on the one side to, to the ocean and the other side, the, the Swartberg Mountains. And uh, during the winter time, they were mostly covered uh, with snow. And then anyway, we had to dig trenches. And at night, 
you know, it would rain and the troops were like in their trenches. And uh, of course, the officers and um, all of them they would sleep in their tents. But I still remember old Sergeant Major Lip would walk around at night because he really cared about these troops. And then at night, he would walk around and, and look at us, you know, you know, uh, trenches shivering. And he would just say, Trooper, just more. When you become a and you And um, you know, eventually we made it, and um, we we were quite happy. Um, our, our training was tough, but um, it was hard as it, it should should have been. Um, at some stage, we did the um, the customary fast bait faith training um, to basically make sure you have what it takes to become a junior leader. So our um, course took us over the the Otaniqua mountains for five days we basically had to cross ostrich farms and the mountains uh, in small groups um, with with kit and we had to every day just get um, very few Russians we had to um, sometimes just find our water you know in the mountains and and we used to get two little cans of food every day with no labels on. So it so happens sometimes that you get a a can green beans French style, you know, the with the watery green beans or mixed veg that we call scrubnel. And then um, you just had to survive, you know. And with every group, you had a, a two corporals or lieutenants that basically accompanied the group to basically you know, check on us and evaluate us. And they would do everything to sort of test you even psychologically. You know, when you're very thirsty, they would open their cold beers and pour it on the ground and just look at you and say, would you like to have a sip? And just pour it on the ground. I can still remember um, there was a certain corporal, Jan Pretorius. Um, he was a, also a legend. He was in our group and um, he he really enjoyed us having a very, very difficult time. But anyway, we managed to cross the mountains and um, get to the other side um, at the given time. And uh, that was uh, winter time. And when we finally reached our destination um, at uh, Herald's Bay um, on the uh, seashore, uh, they prepared a barbecue for us. And um, we were all very happy about the barbecue. And, um, uh, you know, the first fresh meal for, for a long time. But then uh, before eating, the corporal said, Trooper, before you eat, you have to swim. Now, it was winter, and we had to get into the water and um, swim. And um, when we came out of the water, Trooper, now you have to Now, you know, <laughs> after five days on Fosbait, now you have to sing and you have to sing merry songs now and you have to sound happy, which was quite difficult. But um, eventually um, we had to do that. Um, something else that uh, happened at some stage, uh, we were doing um, I think Tain Platalon's uh, uh, training. We were doing helicopter um, drills. You know, a helicopter would pick you up and move you between... Uh, different points. Um, uh, one day, I would, uh, I had, uh, I was in charge of a small group, and you know, when a helicopter comes in, you have to throw a smoke grenade to just show the direction of the of the wind. And I don't know what happened when I pulled the safety pin out; the smoke grenade exploded in my hand, and um, uh, it, I wouldn't say exploded, but it like it it just started to just, it go, went off in my hand. And it burned my hand like it was just a black mass. And um, I was eventually um, evacuated to the sick bay. Um, it was basically just a terrible burn. My skin was black and um, I lost all the skin on my, on my hand. But um, uh, within a week or so, um, I recovered, uh, which was fine. Another interesting thing that um, that happened during our time uh, in Golf Company, um, we were the first uh, company that actually had a get together with the sole duties. 
No, those days the soldiers were in uh, George. So, um, old Samuel Liebenberg, before that time, he used to sort of brief us and say, Trupa, you're going to have young dames on the and you're going to dance with them. But he had for us behoorlijk the Levite vorgelees how we ons ourselves moet gedra and how we ons um, um, nou nie uh, van onszelf moet um, um, varken maak nie. De rechtheid vir ons, in sy majoor terme vir ons vertel, hoe ons ons moet gedra. Ek sal nou nie al die woorde gebruik, soos net in sy majoor, dit kan verduidelik nie. Maar in elk geval, um, uh, by the way, it was, um, it was an interesting experience. I think, after that, we were the first group that did that, and after that, um, similar um, meetings were arranged where uh, infantry, one of the companies at infantry school would either go to George or they would go to infantry school and we would have a, like a, a meal and then uh, like a, just an informal dance with them, which was quite nice. You know, imagine we didn't see many girls in those days, so it was quite an experience. And um, for me, um, I incidentally uh, met a girl that was with me in, um, in folk school, Pochestruum, I still remember her name was Elsa van Gas. And we basically uh, saw each other for the first time there after school. And we were like talking the whole night. And, and even some other girls that we could also recognize. Um, it was um, a unique experience. Those days, not many girls volunteered to do those kind of training. And uh, the training was tough. They were quite um, great doing the training. So... Um, those girls um, did a good job. They, uh, you know, they didn't deploy as soldiers, but they deployed as, as, as officers and NCOs doing clerical duties, and some of them um, doing other duties. Those days, um, of course, they didn't do like uh, the serious bush stuff and those kind of things. But anyway, um, they were great girls. Um, anyway, um, after... Um, my time at a uh, golf company, I think in August, September of that year, our company was uh, disbanded um, because we were like, they were like from A to G companies because our company was the last or maybe the smallest company um, because, you know, while we, we did training as and when um, uh, troops didn't make it, they got injured or they just couldn't make the course, they were RTU, as we used to call it, return to unit. They were returned to the uh, respective unit. So I was then um, um, dealt into Charlie comp Company. Um, why? I still don't know. I, I ended, ended up in the uh, band platoon. You know, each uh, the infantry school had a band, the infantry school band. And my platoon uh, was the, the platoon that played the drums and the trumpets and everything. So um, at that stage, the company commander was uh, Major Pete Wilman, and our Sergeant Major was uh, Sergeant Major Hachie Smith. He became also very legendary later. I think he was Hachar, Hachari um, uh, RSM, a very, he was a typical RSM, but um, tough guy, but, uh, you know, a typical Sergeant Major. Anyway, um, uh, we uh, did. We completed the the training by um, December of that year. Um, I think we were the. Um, I, I forgot to mention you. Know, and in our time, we still had the opportunity to to join for twelve months, eighteen months, or two years. Um, so uh, in those days, if you joined for two years, you could get a bonus of three thousand at the end of your two years. And then um, you did not have to do uh, any camps afterwards. But then incidentally, at the end of our first year, the two years training became compulsory and everybody had to do it anyway. So then um, by the middle of December, we completed our training. And um, I think we were the last group that we never got any sort of ranks. Um, I know later... Uh, the 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 corporals became lance corporals a month or so before the time, and the the uh, officers became candidate officers. So we were the last group that we didn't get any rank up until I think a week or so before 
our passing out parade, we were called into a big auditorium and uh, the officer commanding would stand in front and he would just say, okay, um, the following people, when, when I call out your name, you will become, you will become NCO and you will become a, a, a lieutenant and uh, these will be the units that you will be sent to. So um, it so happened that um, uh, I became a, a, a second lieutenant. Um, I was very fortunate to, to have my parents um, coming down um, for our passing out parade. And, you know, um, for me, it was a great experience having your dad there and putting on your rank after, after the parade. And suddenly now you're a second lieutenant after being a, a troop for your whole year. And um, I think my dad was particularly proud of me because he was um, a, a railway policeman, as you know, and um, he was also an officer at that stage. So for him, it, it meant a lot having a, a son also in the Defence Force. Anyway, um, then I was um, transferred back to Trisai, uh, Potostrum, which I was very happy to, to go to because... Um, uh, that was the unit where I spent my basics. So I, I went uh, back and uh, we were then um, uh, used to um, train the new intake of new um, recruits coming in the, the following year. So um, I became part of um, uh, Delta Company. My company commander was uh, a certain um, Brom Bontanar. Um, and, you know, all the other... Um, Officers that you've had on your show, like Nick Mostert and I know uh, Bori, uh, Boris Borman's brother, Antony Borman, was uh, was also a uh, lieutenant at that stage. Jan Hochart was there and um, various other um, of the officers that you you had on your show. Um, yes, and um, uh, I, I just forgot one um, point that I wanted to mention. Uh, the, the platoon that I was in, in uh, in Oudshorn, uh, had the the son of Gay Corson. You know, Gay Corson was a uh, singer those days. Now his son was Victor Corson, and Victor Corson was um, uh, in our band platoon because he was also a very good musician, and um, he he was uh, you know one of the prominent members uh, in our um, in our platoon, and uh, later I think he became very uh, popular in the. Uh, musical industry, whatever. So then um, uh, at three side, uh, things change. Now suddenly, now you're an officer, you arrive there and um, you move, move into the officer's mess. Um, life changes a lot because now you have your own room. You, you eat like a gentleman now. You, um, every morning you, um, you have your breakfast, you have waiters that serve you and you order your eggs uh, according to your own like and dislike. And, um, um, you know, afternoons we had uh, our meals at the officer's mess. In the evenings you had your dinners. Uh, it really felt great. It almost felt worth it, you know, having all these years or months of tough training and now being an officer. Um, but anyway, we, we, um, we were responsible training the new recruits. Um, and normally they would come in during January and then we would train them for a period of more or less nine months and then they were ready to be deployed. So we put them through their paces, normal basics, and then, uh, you know, the normal field prof and musketry and map reading and everything, uh, conventional, um, counterinsurgency, uh, coin operations, everything. And by the time we got to um, uh, September, we were ready to deploy operationally. So we had two companies um, that had to deploy uh, operationally. Um, my company commander at that stage was um, um, Captain Johan Simon. And the other company commander was um, Captain Wouter Hirhu, also ex Parabat. Now, um, the two companies had to, the one company had to deploy to Wamboland, the other one had to deploy to the Caprivi. And um, the two of them, one night, had to draw straws to decide which company would want to go where. And um, we were then uh, lucky to, uh, to get the Caprivi. 
Um, uh, of course, they were not happy to go to Womberland. Nobody wanted to go to Womberland those days because Womberland at those stage, um, it was tough. Um, and the Caprivi was more relaxed. But then again, it was just, I think, it was September 78. I think the attack on Katima just happened in August. I think you were there at that stage, or maybe you were familiar with that. But uh, the attack just happened. So we arrived at Mapacha uh, in, in um, uh, September of 78. We got our training at uh, Mapacha. And then um, we deployed uh, to Vanilla. I can still remember those days. There, were, uh, there was a, a very well-known officer, Commandant Dirk de Toué. I don't know if you remember him. He was at Burger Sake, and he was a, a guy who, who went, visited all the units with his dog, and uh, he used to um, train us on winning the hearts and minds of the people and, um, you know, how to deal with people and how to interact with them. Because at that stage, there were not, like, a lot of action going on inside the Caprivi. Um, so, uh, right, we arrived at Vanilla, which is, was a beautiful base. Um, we were, like, very, very fortunate because Vanilla is right in the corner of where the Zambezi River turns north and where the, the cop lane starts. So um, uh, right across from Vanilla, there's the uh, little Zambian town of Sesheki. And uh, so we had our op observation post right there, always, you know, observing that area. And Vanilla Base at that stage was uh, a newly built base where they started to build the, um, the ops room and everything, um, you know, on, in bunkers. And it was a, a, a new, newly constructed base for the first time. You know, um, I know many of the bases basically had tents and we had constructed buildings that we, uh, we lived in. So uh, the bases were, was a very nice base. And um, the Caprivi was, a, was a, a beautiful place to deploy. It was green. And of course, you had your sand. It was, everything is flat for the first time we experienced that. But um, it was a green, um, uh, beautiful area with, with lots of wildlife. Um, we started to, uh, you know, do um, platoon patrols in the area. And as it's the custom, you know, the roads all have names there. And for some reason, I can only remember one road. It was Duke's Road. Duke's Road was one of the roads that ran away from, uh, from our base and so our basic task was to dominate the area south of the cop lane. And uh, that's what we did for, uh, for the, uh, a couple of months. And um, then what was also interesting for me at that stage, uh, our base was also used as a sort of a, uh, a base from which some of the special forces guys did operations into Zambia. So um, for the first time, I experienced guys coming from um, the then Bushman Battalion, 3-1 Battalion. They would come to our base. Um, I remember there was a, a, a Franny Conradi, Javi Nell, those days. They were part of the Bushman Battalion. Uh, they were, I think they had a record group as well. And then they, they would come to our base and... Um, they would disappear into Zambia for, uh, for short periods, um, targeting, you know, and very, and doing small group operations. And we would just see, see them leaving and come back. And um, we just heard the operations were successful. So it was fascinating meeting those guys and um, seeing what they, they did um, uh, because uh, a lot of their operations were directed, uh, uh, you know, against, uh, the then, I think, uh, ANC bases um, in the then uh, Zambia area, because as you know, they had their bases um, in Zambia. <clears throat> then um, at some stage, um, we, um, we were given the, the task to move our patrols into Zambia um, to start to dominate the area north of the cop lane and um, um, my platoon was then the first one chosen to go into, um, into Zambia. 
Now you can imagine it was for us, it was quite a, a sort of a frightening experience because for the first time we actually left the safety of um, Namibia or Southwest at that stage. And we were like in a foreign country with the instruction not to be seen because we were not supposed to be seen by the local population. So we were patrolling the area and had a few very close encounters um, with population, but fortunately we were sort of never compromised um, and, and they never uh, really saw us. But um, I would like to share one incident uh, that happened um, one day when we were patrolling the area. Um, I had a, uh, a very, I would say, infamous platoon that I was in charge of. They were the platoon 13 with a lot of very nice guys. You know, when you're in a platoon, you build very close um, bonds with the guys. You know everything. You know about uh, the girlfriends and the uh, uh, family in the States. And, you know, you know everything about each other because you share time in the bush. You share temporary bases. You share when people get letters. You share when they get dear Johnnies. And you share everything. Um, so I had... Um, Three section leaders um, at that stage. The one was uh, uh, Jan Furi, uh, Corporal Jan Furi, the other one, um, um, Johan Jordan, and um, then another one was Corporal Prince Lua. They were my three section leaders. And funnily enough, my platoon sergeant was uh, Willem Jeffer. We were together childhood friends. We um, spend our whole um, primary school uh, time together. And even our families were like house friends. And we ended up in the Defense Force or the Army together, uh, first three side, then infantry school. And we ended up, uh, you know, having the same platoon. I was a pl platoon commander and he the platoon sergeant. So, of course, a very close bond um, between us. But then uh, on uh, this particular day, um, we were like patrolling, and this uh, Johan Jordan was a little bit of a crazy um, guy. Uh, he had something for snakes. Whenever we encountered snakes, he would chase the snakes. And, um, you know, I never knew why, but on this particular day, we were like walking, and suddenly I saw him running, and he was running after something, and the next moment, uh, one of the troops came to me and he said, um, Johan Jordan has been bitten by a snake. Um, I must come immediately. Um, when I got to him, he was uh, down and um, the snake actually got uh, bit him like in his um, lower, um, what is it, Marmeri? Anyway, you know, the Marmeri just above the, his boot. And there I saw the, uh, the, 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 the marks of the, of the snake. Um, and, you know, Immediately, within a few minutes, he was like starting to sweat and um, his face turned uh, white and we knew this was going to be a terrible situation. Now, fortunately, one of the, the other um, guys in the platoon, he had a very sound mind and, well, now I think about it, but he went after the snake and he caught the snake. You know, I know, uh, you know, when people normally when you have a snake bite, it's normally very important to know what kind of snake it is, because that helps when they give the, you know, the, the anti-venom or what, whatever. So he caught the snake and he killed the snake. And it happened to be a black mamba then. Now, the, this black mamba was like, it was probably seven foot. It was a, a huge snake. It was a, a, a big snake. Because a black mamba is is a big snake. And um, then we, you know, we just had our uh, platoon medic, which just, you know, he was just a normal medic that um, didn't have a lot of, of training. They could stabilize a person, but they couldn't really give him lots of, of, of medical uh, assistance. So they just basically stabilized the guy. And then um, as the platoon commander, I had to immediately make communications with, with headquarters. And, um, uh, you know, in our uh, platoon, we used to have the A53 uh, radios, but the radios were just for short distance. 
connections. We used the B25. That was the bigger radio, which we used for long distance uh, communications. And I had my old signaler. Um, his name was old Beekus. He was always walking behind me, carrying the B25. I said, Beekus, now you have to get communications quickly. And this guy was, you know, uh, hats off to my signaler. You know, always when I needed communication, he used to throw out the antenna and he used to know which way to throw it out. And lo and behold, he got um, communications with, with uh, the headquarters and I could quickly um, get uh, um, the report through to, to the company headquarters. And I reported, you know, I have a, a crisis. Um, one of my uh, soldiers was bitten by a snake. And uh, fortunately, within, I would say within 20, 25 minutes, the Alouette um, was there and um, he was Kazavak back to Mapacha. And um, uh, he, he then, he got, uh, I, I forgot the number, but they had to give him a, a, a lot of ampules of anti-venom into his um, uh, leg. And uh, when we arrived back uh, in, into the camp, you know, we, we saw actually, you know, what it looked like. It, it turned green and purple. You know, a snake bite looks, it looks really terrible. But f finally, this guy um, recovered. And um, what was very interesting, I, I, I think I should share it here. This guy, Johan Jordan, um, he would later, um, after they, uh, you know, left the army at the end of 79, um, later, I heard he he then got married to one of my, I would like to say, uh, ex-girlfriend, so to speak, but not really a girlfriend. But when we were still in school, I had this girl that I was um, uh, crazy about. And her name was Judy, Judy um, Hrmbiek. And um, she got married to him. And, you know, we didn't even know, uh, you know, uh, Probably when, when they got married, he told her about me and, uh, you know, they, they knew that then. But then what happened, uh, sadly, um, Johan Jordan, a few years later, got cancer. And he died as a young, a young married, in his early, I wonder if it was even late 20s, early 30s, he died of cancer. And... Um, the very same doctor that treated him at Mapacha for his snake bite was the same doctor that treated him for cancer just his final days before he died. So that was something, you know, it's a rare coincidence, but, but um, th that happened. Um, then, of course, um, our time um, in the Caprivi, Caprivi basically um, nothing much uh, else uh, happened um, by the, uh, you know, the other platoon commanders were um, Boris Borman, Bram Vantanar, Nick Mostert. Um, at the end of um, 78, they returned uh, to South Africa because they then became company commanders to, because they were, both of, or the three of them were senior um, permanent force members uh, at that stage. Um, at that stage, I joined short service. Don't know if you're familiar with that, but there was a system, short service, that was uh, brought into the army to to uh, get more officers to join, and um, maybe just to strengthen the ranks of of the leader group. And um, they would pay uh, pay you uh, like a bonus um, for joining, and then also another bonus when you complete a year or two years. And um, I, for me, that was a very attractive option. And I joined short service. And that was my um, first opportunity to buy a car. And my first car was a Volkswagen Kiewer. Um, and uh, that was wonderful to, you know, to, uh, to be able to have a car. So the, the car I, I, I bought just before leaving on a first border duty. But anyway, um, I talk a, bit, a little bit uh, confusing uh, between going back and forth. But anyway, I, I'm sure you understand. Um, at the end of, of uh, 78, they returned back and we had new officers joining us from, uh, from infantry school. Um, I remained and um, 
uh, we had another uh, officer joining us from the military academy. Um, his name was Tokis Tutue. Um, he was a young officer just joining us. He became part of our company. Um, he was then the, uh, I think, the, uh, the 2IC. And Captain Johan Simon was still the, the officer commanding. We completed our time uh, until uh, February. And then we returned uh, back to uh, South Africa. Now, as is uh, customary, when you return back, um, we have a, you know, your seven day pass, everybody goes on vacation. And um, when we returned, um, we, uh, we did retraining. And uh, upon returning, um, Twakis the Tue then became the company commander of our company. Um, and then uh, Johan Simon, uh, our company commander, I think he, he just then uh, did a, a military course or something like that. And um, I, was, I then became the company 2IC. And Tokis the Tue was the, the company commander. His name was also, I think, Jakubus something, the Tue. But his nickname was Tokis. Uh, we actually became great friends uh, at that time. And um, then our company uh, retrained to be deployed in uh, Wolvomboland um, later uh, that year. So um, we trained and uh, I think during September of, of um, uh, that year, or not September, uh, May of that year, we deployed to Wamberland. We first went to Oshavello, as you know, is, is uh, normally the case. So we did our acclimatization in Oshavello, and then we um, were deployed to 5-4 um, Battalion, which is Inana, um, uh, a base, uh, I think, about 10 kilometers from the Angolan border. At that stage, the the base commander there was um, uh, Commandant Lo Trichard. Um, he used to have his little um, prefab little house in the base. We all lived in tents. And he would, um, every weekend, um, just take a chopper back to Oshakati, where his family used to live. And, and sometimes his wife used to uh, visit him there, uh, even in um, uh, Yanana. Uh, the 2IC was normally a major that uh, did a, a period of three months from one of the SAI units. At that stage, it was a major Tini Smits, who later also um, became a commandant or a colonel in, uh, in 5 SAI. Um, and um, we were then um, a company responsible for patrolling the area and just... Um, showing a presence in the Wamberland area. Um, fortunately, during that time there, um, nothing much happened. We, um, we had our patrols and we, we never really had any contacts. Um, although contacts took place in 5152 uh, Battalion at some stage, in our area, it was relatively quiet. Um, but, you know, we um, sometimes picked up spores and those kind of things, but never really contacts. Uh, we had a sort of a very crazy intelligence officer there, Captain Kusadi. He was an um, uh, intelligence officer and he once went um, on a sort of operation into, into um, Angola and uh, we, we had to be on standby as a sort of a reaction force to go in and assist them if they, you know, got into a contact uh, and they needed reinforcements. And um, it then so happened that uh, one day they were in a contact and we had to, um, you know, get into the Puma helicopters and we were flown in. And um, we, we, when we landed in the area, you know, there was Kusadi, I'm just uh, against a tree and smoking a cigarette and just laughing you know he was a crazy guy he was he was a you know i assume he was in many contexts but he's just been through a contact but he was sitting there laughing and he, and we were just like adrenaline in our bodies you know waiting for something to happen but then the enemy anyway fled and 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 nothing happened and uh we um we all returned 
question you must just tell me how we're doing for time. I I know you said an hour and a half. You, you must just tell me when you think we should um, stop. Uh, I just want to sort of share um, another interesting incident um, that happened at Inanna. Um, you know, in, in those days, we had the... Um, the uh, the toilets were like um, holes that were dug underground. And from time to time, we had to get uh, these trucks that had to basically come to suck the human waste from the holes. And these trucks were called the honey suckers. I don't know if you heard this term before. They were called the honey suckers. There was some, there's an interesting story about that too. Uh, at the beginning, um, where you know in the in the uh, border area they always use code names, and um, one day um, you know, I was told the story. Uh, one base was told the honeysucker will visit your base today, and everybody thought that it was a code name for a high rank officer. And then finally, <laughs> here arrived the the truck just to to um to suck the waste. But anyway, um, on that given day, the honeysucker was there to to suck the waste from this uh, hole. And something happened. There was a, you know, it, it had a pipe with a connection that had to connect. And for some reason, a, a very, uh, an important connection fell into the hole. And the hole, um, the, the truck couldn't function because of this, um, this important part that had to connect with the, 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 the pipe on the one side and the pipe on the trunk. So there was only one option. Somebody had to recover this link from this hole of waste, human waste. And, um, you know, heads were put together there and um, a volunteer was asked uh, for, and he was basically promised the one who's willing to do this will get seven days back to the States. And there was this corporal, I don't remember his name, he was uh, like an old, um, I think it's a German name, Zich Kuschka. He was from uh, five star in those days. He volunteered. Now, I remember I was there, you know, him going down, basically down and taking this component from this hole and he came up. Now imagine what he looked like. He was covered. I'm not going to give the details, but you know he had to shower a couple of times um, to get himself clean. <laughs> but that was a very, very funny incident. And of course, he was very happy because he got his seven days um, past the the the, um, the officer commanding or the two I see kept his word and old uh, Zich. He left for the States for seven days and uh, um, that was, um, you know, uh, a good deed that he did because uh, I think none of us were prepared to do that because it was, it was a, a crucial job to do, but nobody was willing to do that. But um, Zich was willing to do that. So um, good for him. Um, then um, that brings to an end... Um, our time, more or less, the end of um, September, we uh, went back to the States and um, we went on uh, seven days uh, leave again. And um, upon returning, um, we were then informed that we had to train for a special operation that was going to take place. Um, we didn't know much about it, but then um, my company commander, Twakis de Tue, uh, he was a lieutenant then, um, I was a lieutenant, and then there was Mijo Delport, you probably heard of him. He was an um, Italian um, commander of 3-2 Battalion at some stage. He was a captain at that stage, also one of the captain, uh, the company commanders, and the other one was Jan Hochar. They were the three company commanders. They were then one day flown out on a mission to be um, briefed on the special operation. And um, then uh, upon returning, 
um, we were told, okay, we were going to deploy to Rhodesia. Um, that was the special operation. I think it was called Ops Bowler or Task Force X-Ray. Um, the the officer commanding that you also had on your show uh, years ago, uh, 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 Commandant Roland de Vries, then uh, um, he was our task force commander. Um, so we trained and we had to prepare to deploy in Rhodesia, the south of Rhodesia. That was the time, I think, just before um, elections, a, a very difficult time in Zimbabwe, just before they had their final elections. I think it's on a PF. I, I, I mean, I, it was uh, Mugabe and um, Sitole. I cannot remember the, the guys that were contesting the elections. But anyway, our, our task was to go and um, uh, dominate the southern part of, of Rhodesia. Then, so... Um, the first thing that was very important that we we had to all our R1 rifles had to be taken to the stores and all the numbers had to be removed because when we uh, when we uh, were deployed we were not supposed to have anything on us that would show that we are from South Africa. So uh, one uh, early morning then we left Poch three um, companies all in hippos. We left in a huge convoy of hippo, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, anti-mine vehicles. They were like, you know, top heavy vehicles. Other than the buffles, they were like closed uh, on top, but very top heavy. I think they were built on a Bedford um, base. Uh, but very difficult to drive, but uh, quite effective as uh, 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 anti-mine uh, vehicles. But we left, we left Poch in this huge convoy. How we didn't draw attention, I still don't know <laughs> up to this day, because imagine a convoy of 50 hippos going north. Um, it never appeared in, in any newspaper as far as I know. Um, and we headed for a period uh, or uh, uh, an area in northern Transvaal near near by bridge called Madimbo, um, which was a training area. Um, when we arrived there, we were all um, equipped with camouflage uniform and um, um, you know all the equipment um, and trained for a for a, a period. And then finally, we were briefed that we were going to deploy into um, into Rhodesia. Um, now, our two companies, um, A company was um, Jan Hochart with his company. B company was um, uh, Tokis de Tue, and I was the company 2IC with our three platoons. The platoons were only three platoons uh, strong then. Um, the platoon commanders were basically uh, Harry Els, Benny Greiling and Johan Marx, I, I still remember, and I was the company to IC. And then Micho Del Port with his company, Charlie Company. Now, uh, A and B Company, basically, we crossed the border at Bight Bridge with our uh, vehicles. And Charlie Company, they crossed the, um, what is it, Lepopo River, and they started to basically dominate the area from there, and they walked in to our destination, which was going to be the uh, Mabalahuta tribal area. There was an airfield, I think 70, 80 kilometers into, into Rhodesia. So um, after two days, um, we arrived. Uh, I remember our first, first uh, uh, area where we stopped was uh, a town in Rhodesia called Triangle. Um, and um, it was still, you know, we we didn't encounter any um, enemy at that stage. So we, I think the southern area was very much the anti-ZANU forces at that stage, but they were um, becoming more aggressive, and the South African government 
probably decided to sort of um, uh, dominate a certain area. I, I don't know if they wanted to influence the outcome of the election or whatever. But then finally we arrived um, at uh, Mabala Uta. There was like a, a landing strip there. And um, we had um, a tent there, and but not basically enough for everybody to basically live there because the idea was not to to stay there. The idea was just to get out and deploy. So um, uh, we were out very, very soon and deployed uh, as a company. Um, while we were deployed, um, wherever we basically moved, we had to do um, uh, road sweeping and we lived a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, anti-vehicle mines uh, because uh, the area, uh, different from Obamberland, the area there in the southern uh, Rhodesia is like hilly and gravel roads, uh, rocky. So um, it was, uh, there were lots of mines that we were uh, lifted uh, at, at that time. Um, and um, then uh, on a particular day, our company was deployed, uh, the whole company, and uh, we had a, a instruction to dominate a certain area. Um, and we had a, a truck with us um, uh, on the track, uh, you know, with some Russians and um, uh, a 60 millimeter mortar and some bombs and things. And we came to a place where we decided to have the, the um, overnight temporary base. And uh, the area was, was uh, safe. Uh, I think as the leader group, uh, we, uh, we, we found the right place to have the temporary base. Um, it was basically dense with um, smallish trees, but we had decent cover. Um, so we had a temporary base, and um, the next morning, you know, as is uh, the custom, when, when you're in a temporary base, you have like stand two in the evenings um, before last, uh, last light, and then again before first light, you have stand two. The next morning, the 3rd of December, 1979, um, if I can remember correctly, we had stand two and um, we were just standing down and everybody was sort of more relaxed and getting ready to prepare breakfast and make coffee. And suddenly our base was under attack from all directions. Um, we, we had mortars raining on us, small arms. So um, Tokis and I, grabbed our rifles and we ducked behind the, the nearest tree because our company headquarters was basically in the middle. And of course, it was within a few seconds of us um, ducking behind the tree. And Tokes indicated, he just, you know, he looked at me and he just said, Johan, I just skip. And um, that was a one of the saddest moments in my life was where a very close friend of mine was basically killed right next to me. Um, the bullet basically got in right here next to his um, neck here. It went through his body and the bullet was still stuck here by his hip area. But he was, he was I think he was killed basically. After he said those words, he, I could see um, he was dead, and um, uh, and there you can imagine. Here I was, I was a a young lieutenant, twenty years old. Suddenly, I had to take command of this this company. Um, I was the two I see, and my my uh, commander is shot, is killed, and um, my troops are shooting, basically returning fire, and. Um, and I could hear that I had casualties at that stage. Now, then we had a, um, a transport NCO with us, a Sergeant Henny Kilder. Um, he was a more experienced permanent force guy at that stage. I was like drawing his attention because he was nearby. And I told him, Henny, talk his, his kid. Um, and he came 
And, you know, in, in spite of being under fire, he got up and he ran and he turned talkies over and he was doing hot massage and he was really trying to resuscitate him. But it, it soon was clear to, to him too um, uh, that, you know, it, it was just something that, that wasn't going to happen. So uh, any then, um, he was the person that was ready to leave with the truck and, and everything on the truck that morning. He basically got the, uh, the mortar pipe from the, from the uh, truck and he started to fire mortars back uh, at you know the direction from which we were under attack, and uh, there was like uh, probably firing going on for ten or fifteen minutes, and uh, at that stage um, I was just like um, had to take control and just uh, you know get got the troops to stop firing because you cannot just keep firing, not knowing you know whether the enemy has fled or not, and when we stopped firing we basically realized that nothing was basically coming our way uh, any longer. And we had about 10 of our troops that got um, very um, serious shrapnel wounds because it was a dense uh, uh, area with lots of trees. So when the mortars exploded, uh, there was a lot of shrapnel coming onto the guys' uh, uh, backs. So we had a lot of, I think we had about 10 troops that got uh, wounded in the backs, but none of them were that serious. But then, of course, um, I had to quickly um, make comms with our, uh, you know, um, uh, headquarters, and um, I got uh, communications with Commandant De Vries at that stage, and my message to him was just at that stage our code word for company commander was Sun Ray. And the company 2IC was Sunray Minor. So I just said, our Sunray Minor was critically, I didn't want to announce that he was dead. I just uh, told him he was critically wounded. And um, we had several uh, wounded uh, soldiers and I had to send a um, uh, helicopter um, as quickly as possible to, to um, Kazavak, the soldiers. Now, uh, very, very quickly, you know, the Alouette, an Alouette or two, um, I can't remember if it was two or one, arrived. And um, the wounded guys were um, put into the into the choppers and uh, Twakis' body was, was also then removed. Um, then uh, Major Willem Welchemuth, he was the, the two I see of our uh, task force. He flew in because obviously... Um, he knew at that stage, I mean, there was a, me, the, maybe the unexperienced young lieutenant suddenly had to take charge of a, of a company where I just lost my company commander. He had to just come in and, um, you know, provide some assistance. So he came in and, 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 and took charge. And, um, uh, you know, we um, then moved back and... Um, the company was later deployed again uh, several times um, until we left the area um, early December. Now, um, when we left the area to return to the northern Transvaal and Mandimbo area at that time, we were um, living via Dakotas. And... Um, the day when we left, um, I was, uh, you know, you know, just getting all my equipment and we got into the Dakota and we left and we were just in the air for uh, a few minutes. And I was, because there was just, they, they did low flying because the area had lots of uh, in, enemy movement at that stage. Um, I looked down out of the window and I saw movement on the ground. And that very moment, I was looking down, of course, uh, you'll not believe it, I was looking down at my two boots and holes came through the fuselage of the airplane. And i suddenly felt a, a pain in my back. And when I looked back, 
the holes came through the the, the fuselage of the uh, the bottom and basically went out behind me my back i felt the pain in my back and but i didn't want to sort of get up because i realized that our uh, dakota was being shot at and we were worried you know whether we were going to stay in the air or not um so fortunately uh, you know the, the dakotas i mean many people have said that um, those were planes. They were once they were in the air. They they seldom got down, and then after they landed, they didn't get up again. But you know, while they were in the air, they they, they were they stayed there. And uh, once we uh, we arrived um, at uh, Madimbo, they um, immediately had the the medics there, and um, they they took me to the um, uh, medic tent there. So fortunately for me then, uh, it was in my back, I had um, the, the, of the steel uh, fuselage of the, of the airplane um, pieces just got stuck into my ba- back, but not fortunately not deep. Um, they could just uh, remove them. Uh, I think it wasn't even necessary for stitches. It, it was just basically taking out the few pieces of, of metal and, um, sterilizing the wounds and and that was it but i had a very 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 close shave um uh, you know during that trip out but of course then um we uh we returned and um this uh, company they came to the end of their national service and uh they all um, handed back their equipment and cleared out and for me, it was very sad that I never got to meet the family of old Twakis de Tue because, you know, I had to return with all his equipment and it was basically, I had to pack all his stuff, you know, his bag and everything. And I think at that stage, maybe they had a chaplain or whatever returning, those kind of things that had their ways to deal with it. But I never had the chance to just talk to his family for, for a time. And I, I really wanted to do that, but for some reason I never had that chance. And, um, uh, you know, as it happened many, many years ago, uh, now a few months ago on Facebook, I, I met a niece of Twakis the Tue and she told me, but Johan, uh, we want we're really looking for clarity about what happened on that day because nobody ever told us what happened. And I was able to share with her what happened during his last minutes. And it, it really meant a lot to the family and uh, to such an extent that um, I'm planning to go to South Africa during October this year. And we already set up a meeting with the family because I really want to spend time with his family, of course, his parents are, are, are deceased by now, but his sisters, he never had brothers, but he had a, a sisters and other family members who every year when it was the, um, the day that he died, they remembered his, his death, but they never had clarity on what happened. So um, I'm already, you know, um, planning to see them and really looking forward to see the family. And then just one, um, uh, maybe one last remark that I want to make uh, to cover this operation is the um, uh, Henny Kilder, which was the guy that did, um, uh, you know, first aid on, on Twakis when he was almost dead and was able to get the mortars to fire back at the enemy. When we returned, um, I basically uh, had a meeting with uh, Major Willem Belchemut, our 2SC at that stage, and I told him that this guy, Henny Kilder, did a very, very good job, uh, actually, of bravery. Um, and uh, at that st- I mean, I was a junior officer at that stage, um, and I really, I recommended that, I think this guy's act of bravery um, was good enough to have him nominated for uh, uh, Honoris Crux. Um, and um, Major Willem Belgemuth then asked me to, you know, uh, uh, 
put it on paper, there was a specific performer that you had to complete when you nominate some, someone for a, for a Norris Crooks. And um, I did that. Of course, um, Major uh, Willem Welchmoed did the refining changes and it was submitted. And then Henny Kilder uh, actually was a receiver of the Honoris Crux of what he did on that day. And, um, uh, you know, uh, what he did was was absolutely brave. Uh, he was probably the, because he was already a permanent force for a number of years at that stage. We, the rest of us were like junior officers. Um, so he probably, he'd been in, in, in contact before. So, and he basically reacted, you know, instinctively he was willing to during the contact jumping up and performing uh, you know uh, resuscitation procedures jumping up and getting the mortars to, to fire back and i think the mortars did a very good job of getting the enemy to to flee because later when we cleared up the area we find a lot of um uh, guns and um uh, pistols and you could see the enemy was fleeing in a haste uh, when we you know responded back so what Henny Kilder did on that day was a very well deserved act of bravery and um, I um, I will never never dispute the fact that he was a brave guy at that stage who put his own life um, at risk by um, firstly helping his officer commanding and um, providing, um, you know, first aid. He was a, a first aid, uh, I think he did a first aid course at that stage. He was a well-seasoned permanent force member. And then later to get the mortars to fire back was, um, was something that, you know, a typical, you know, young officers like us, um, you know, we, this, these were our first experiences of, of real contact. And um, uh, Henny was well deserved of that, and um, unfortunately, we we lost contact. We never met, but I know his story was also included in the book. I think written by L.J. Fainter many years ago about Honoris Crooks, and his story was uh, was written in there. But I just want to say, well deserved. Henny killed her. Uh, he was a, a well deserved receiver. Uh, I hope he's well. Um, I'd really want to, I hope, through this program, maybe, that Henny will be able to to watch this program and would like to make contact with him. Uh, because after uh, those years, um, I know he became an officer. He was a sergeant. Uh, he became an officer. I think he retired as a lieutenant colonel in, in the army. His brother, incidentally, was also, if I'm not mistaken, he was Gert Kilder, uh, uh, reconnaissance guy, you know, a fear car. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was with with a longer bond um, guys. Well, internet, I can tell you, we we interrupted this so that we can have a few questions before it's too late, you know, before I forget about it. But I do make notes. I don't just sit there and looking bored in the other side. I'm never bored, actually. I'm joking. Today's a special day, by the way. It's the 21st of May when we're recording this. Um, will be a little bit different by the time you see it. But two things happened on this day. The first one was uh, it's the day in 2014 when my late wife uh, passed. So wow. I'm actually very, very happy to speak to someone and having a few jokes in between. It's almost like a dark cloud around my head. And then also at the same time now in the Furtracker Monument, the Free to Battalion guys are having their parade there for Sabati Day and the rest of them who lost their lives. We were there last year. I don't know if you guys have seen the video, but if you haven't, please go and look at it. That is really something. They were standing there in their camouflage berets. That camouflage, by the way, come from the police. They stole it from us. And then oh. uh, we used it. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to. I have got a few of them who actually uh, acknowledged guilt. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm just saying they there and they read the names actually of the people who were passed. And it is fantastic. And we also recorded three different uh, Portuguese soldier officers, you know, as black officers of them, which is coming out. Uh, oh. So we're, our thoughts are with them today as well. And just to say, I left Katima Mulilu just a few, a month or so before that attack. 
1978, we came back to the Republic. Uh, I was in standard free then. I was still, still very, very young, but I knew things were happening because there were attacks. There were many attacks on Katimom a little before. There were mortar attacks. There were shootings. There were all sorts of things going on. Um, I think Dr. Johan Yelov, Sr., spoke about that attack with Germany. He was, he was on the Ad Legacy, and he was actually the chaplain right when those guys got killed. He was there within minutes. And then it's funny okay. to me, you know, the more you speak to people on Legacy, the more the same names always come out. Uh, this commandant, Dirk de Toy, uh, there's a book written about him, which was also on Legacy by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Johan van Weingart, wrote that book. I'll leave the links here. It's a really, it's a great book about a great man. He happens to be the uncle of Koki the Toy, who got shot dead at one recce uh, with um, uh, SVF for e and of course Vainon the Toy was Koki's brother, who we all know about okay. and was invited to uh, the yes. show. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Small world, isn't it? And I also remember when uh, you're talking about a uh, grenade, which uh, the smoke grenade in your hand, those bloody things did go off sometimes immediately. Um, uh, yeah. it, it did happen. And they were designed, I remember, our tear gas, tear gas grenades in, in the police were absolutely designed to melt from the heat so that they can't pick it up and throw it back at you. So if you found somebody walking in a crowd with an oven glove, yeah, okay, I uh, I know why he has that oven glove with him. You know, so, so that's why. And I'm wondering, Jan, perhaps somebody can tell us, if you don't know, is this Corporal... Tinus von Stalin of yours. I think he became a free to battalion company commander. He retired as a colonel as well, if it's the same guy. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you I'm know not sure. Beyond? I'm not sure what happened uh, to Tinus. I know he became an officer um, because the very next year, and that is what I'm going to talk about next, um, we did um, formative training for officers and he then he was one of the um, the course participants, but I lost track of of uh, Tinus's career. But um, it's quite likely that it's it's Tinus Fasson because I don't think there are too many Tinus Fasson But he was he was quite a legendary guy, um, um, very you know um, fierce corporal. I would say. I mean, I can remember when I was a troop. Um, I had uh, times running with sandbags and water buckets, and um, he really, he was a, a corporal that made a troop's life miserable. And I often, you know, <laughs> when we were uh, a, a colleague, so to speak, I often told him that, and he would just laugh. Uh, I mean, that's what a corporal is supposed to do. A corporal is supposed to make a, a recruit's life hard and uh, especially you know when you do leader group training um it is about you know getting the the toughest guys to get through to the other side i mean and you you have to have a way to to shift them and so it's it's just like you know breaking a guy psychologically if a, if a person cannot take it you you will just leave i mean in those days they they call it the rtus if you didn't make it, you would return to unit, return to unit. So all the, the infantry companies on a regular basis got back, um, you know, infantry school soldiers that just fell off the course because um, you had to be so careful because if, imagine if you got hurt, um, any injury, and you couldn't continue with the course. They just threw you off the course. So... Um, it 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 uh, infantry school uh, training was was tough. I hope it's still tough today. But um, it was hard. You you never walked there. You were like on the low pass all the time. It was just um, you know, hot training. But it it should so it should be. You know, when you when you train a leader group, you need people that have to excel more than your your average soldier because they have to take the lead that is why they are leaders you know and you need strong leaders to lead people um you know the 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 examples of our leaders that did exceptional things you know we were i mean i listened to your conversations with um 
some of the guys, you know, that did operations, they were young leaders in their 20s. But the type of things that they executed was uh, absolutely unbelievable. I mean, um, I just, you cannot believe the amount of responsibility that those guys took on their shoulders. And sometimes, you know, uh, you couldn't be compromised because South Africa, it was denied so many times that South Africa were pre was present in, in, in other countries. It was, I can still remember, a Pope Buddha, you know, on the news, categorically denying, you know, that there's any troops. And we would listen on that news, you know, in in Angola, but he categorically denied that they, they were troops. And uh, as soldiers, we had to do the hard work. Um, but as you know, um, the politicians on uh, those days, they, they actually stabbed us in the back and uh, things didn't happen the way we expected it to be. And, um, you know, there's, there's water under the bridge anyway. But um, back to your questions, uh, Chris. Yeah, I just want to say that this major sponsor of us, this uh, George, M. Jaf, George M. James fellow, he writes in his books that all polit politicians are part of a third brigade because they float in what they speak. And that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. I mean, politicians are disgusting people. But funny enough, when, when you were speaking about that girls you met, a young woman, of Army College, we actually do have a general, Major General uh, MJ Duplessis coming on the show. And he was the first commander of that Army College, and he was a paratrooper, oh. and he was also a commander at Kasinga. And he said to me when he arrived, and he's 90 years old now, but what a wonderful Wimdupas we call him. He said when he arrived actually there to, to take over the Lompo School or something, which became a college, there was a very tough uh, matrona or tani sitting there, and she didn't, got, she didn't get the message. So he walks in there as a young lieutenant colonel from the paratroopers, and she basically chased him out of the office. It's <laughs> told him, you just go, you so will you? You're not like yeah. you. Know, you and, uh, well, that is fantastic. But let's carry on. I really want to know what happened further and about the culture of the academy academy, uh, the military academy, as well as the culture inside the, the Cape Collet Corps, because that's one of the okay. oldest units in South Africa, by the way. That's right. Uh, but, but that's a very right. famous unit. I would still want to speak some of, to some of the people, uh, but now we got you, and so now we're listening. Okay. Um, then, um, at the beginning of um, 1980, as I was a young um, uh, permanent force officer, I had to do the uh, formative course for young officers. That is the first course when you do when you join uh, as a permanent force member. You do a formative course. Now these courses uh, all over the years they did them in Heidelberg at the Army Gymnasium. But um, if I'm not mistaken, our group in 1980 was the first group where they moved them to the SA Army College, which was in Foot Tracker Wuchter. Uh, the very same place where um, they had the staff courses for senior officers. So um, I started um, my formative course there. Um, I think the officer commanding at that stage of the formative branch was um, Major, Major Brunk. He was a very prim and proper guy, very regimental. And um, we were like a group of... Um, I think we were like about 60 officers from um, various uh, units uh, doing this course. It was a course that you had to do as an officer. It was the, the entry-level course for for all officers. You, you had to undergo that um, before you would proceed uh, to do any other courses. Uh, it's your first military course, actually. Um, so the very first day uh, when we arrived, um, we had a 25 kilometer run um, and you know we were like put on the course and we uh, had to run and as we came in they basically used uh, your basically your position to divide us into two groups so the number one would go into this group number two so 
throughout the course, we were in two groups. So the two groups were like equally sort of measured as far as their fitness levels uh, were concerned. Um, so uh, I remember I was quite fit at that stage. Um, I remember a, a, a paratrooper, can't remember his name. He came first and I um, came second on this course. Um, I was quite fit. Uh, and I especially, especially I trained for, for this course because I knew this was going to happen. Somebody gave me sort of a warning before that time. They said, on the first day, you do like a 25 kilometer run. But anyway, we, um, we did, uh, we started with this course. Um, we had our um, own rooms at the Army College. And of course, we were trained in various aspects, um, um, uh, military law and uh, uh, etiquette and um, the officer and gentleman, you know, how you should behave as an officer. I cannot uh, remember too much of the course, but the, uh, the course uh, happened over a period of, uh, I think, three, four months. Um, previously, the course was uh, six months when it was still at the Army gym Gymnasium, but they shortened it a little bit to three to four months. Um, and um, then um, during the course, we, we had our... Um, um, mess dresses. You know, in the army, we had the mess, special mess dresses for formal. I think you also had that in the police. Police, a special mess dress that you, we call them monkey suits. Um, we wore them during formal dinners. So we we had a guy coming one day and measured us and we had the uh, mess dresses made for us. And um, then we had our first formal dinner. We were actually for the first time we were trained, you know, that um, as officers, uh, this is uh, how you conduct a formal uh, um, formal dinner. Now, I don't know, you, you must have attended them, some of them over the years, but the formal dinners are quite unique in the sense that um, there's a specific procedure that you follow. You, you walk in and then everybody will drink a sherry. And... Um, and then as soon as you finish your sherry, then you walk in to the uh, tables. And once you walk in, you are not allowed to leave. That is the rule. You are not allowed to. Um, it's a very strict rule. You cannot leave to have a bathroom break. So you have to be very careful to not drink anything before the time that can cause bladder problems. So um, then you basically would walk in and... Um, uh, then it's like various courses are served. And then it's like a first, um, I think it's a sherry. And then it's uh, white wine with a fish. And then it's red wine with the main course. And um, then it is, uh, then they basically remove everything. And then they serve port. And when port is served, then everybody has to be ready for the, uh, what do they call it? The toast. And, you know, as soon as everybody's class is filled, everybody would stand up and the toast is always to the state president. Everybody would stand up and the toast is done on the state president. And then you would sit down, you finish your port. And that is the first time you basically get up and um, leave the room. And then there was basically a scattering to the bathrooms because some guys you know had to do bathroom breaks very very quickly and during these times at the tables you know were also the the, the times where you had the naughty guys that did the mischievous things and it's it's always been part of formal dinners um you know often people say but you know as officers you know there's a book oh, the officer and the gentleman you have to be a gentleman but as officers we're actually very naughty uh, at, uh, at times. When you do it together, especially these formal lunches, you always have guys crawling under the tables, tying guys' shoes, um, at, you know, and doing things, very, very mischievous things. And, um, you know, uh, and, uh, imagine a guy's shoes are tied and then... Uh, by the time he has to race and he just suddenly falls down because he never realized his shoes, his shoes got tied. But anyway, you always had like a, uh, uh, the president 
of the formal dinner, he would like sit in the middle and they had like the vice press. He was the guy that was like, I had to sit and make notes of the guys that misbehaved. And the guys that misbehaved, they normally were on orders the next day in front of the officer good morning because, uh, you know, you had to behave like an officer. But it was almost like a tradition. When the officers were together, they always were um, things happening under that table. And even afterwards, you know, uh, afterwards, uh, it was time for, um, I think, sherries and liqueurs. There was like a whole sequence of events. And then, you know, the, the guys had some more serious drinking going on there. And normally, as was the case, um, most of the times, they ended up in having scrums. You had, you would get two groups, you know, imagine the officers in the, we call it monkey suits, the monkey, the mess dresses. And then to scrum was like almost a, it was just part of it. They, uh, at any stage of a formal dinner, there had to be a scrum, and it was always it always ended up in a disaster. And there was always the next day, uh, guys on orders in front of the officer commanding because there was always some mischievous activity that happened. But anyway, um, the the formative course was a was a great course. We uh, we enjoyed it. Um, um, you know, after uh, that was done, um, I returned back to um, to my uh, unit, which was uh, three three SI infantry battalion in in Potchefstroom, and then um, I uh, I had to take uh, a company to operational service, a company that was an old company that. Uh, that was the final year. Uh, I was made the company um, commander, even as a young lieutenant. Um, senior permanent force members were actually very scarce at that time. Uh, at that, you know, the early 80s, uh, many of us were very uh, inexperienced officers that had to take charge of, of companies, taking them to the operational area. And there I was as a young officer, just completed uh, formative uh, training, and I had to take this uh, company to, to the border. Um, we went to uh, Oshigello, which was the um, area where we, we did acclimatization training, just uh, evaluated, uh, you know, before you got ready. And then you were basically um, deployed. Um, then um, I, I ended up at 5-3 uh, Battalion with um, Colonel um, Jordan, Jordan at that stage. Um, but I just quickly have to uh, interject here. Before leaving for the Army, uh, the, the operational service, uh, a week before the time, I developed, a, you know, what did they call it? A Pitzweer. In those days, we call it the blutfint or a pit sweat. I don't have the... Uh, oh, we will get the name for it. But anyway, I developed this on my, on my uh, neck. And I went to the sick bay and there was this doctor uh, cutting it open for me. And um, uh, I told him that I'm about to be deployed to the operational service. And he said, what a coincidence. He, he was going too very, very soon. Um, he was a, a second lieutenant Geddes, a Jewish guy. Uh, I remember very well. Um, as was the case those days, the doctors, they as soon as they qualified, they had to do a, a year military training. And many of them were operationally deployed. So um, then uh, when I uh, arrived in the operational area, um, I, I was a, a company commander there with uh, Colonel uh, Commandant Jordan, and my company was basically um, um, in charge of uh, dominating the area around, because 53 Battalion was near the Air Force Base on Dangwa, and we had to basically just dominate and patrol the, the area there. Um, then, uh, a, I think a week or two after we arrived, um, 
we got the news that uh, a, a vehicle on the way from Oshivelo, which was the, the place where we got the training, they were ambushed on the way to Undongwa and uh, there were like casualties. And as um, fate would have it, this very same doctor that treated me for my um, uh, problem that I had on my neck, he was the guy that was fatally killed on this. Uh, they were all like, all the doctors were just thrown onto the back of a Magiras Deutz a big truck those days. And they were just, um, they didn't have any escorts. They just left um, a few hours before uh, last light and they were on their way to Ondangwa or Chikatu area. And they they, they uh, drove into a, an ambush and they were ambushed. And this guy was, was killed instantly uh, in this ambush. Um, uh, next day, um, you know, uh, Commandant uh, Jordan at that stage, he just said, Johan, um, get your rifle and let's, Let's go. Uh, uh, in, uh, we got into his Land Rover and we drove to to the site. Uh, um, and you know, there was next to the road. They had their little. They made it like a little protection for them with uh, tree trunks, and they basically ambushed uh, this this truck. Fortunately for them, they only had one casualty, but uh, that was a, a sad thing. And especially, you know, when I realized this was the very guy that that um um you know treated me for this um problem i had on my neck just prior to to going to the operational area so then um uh you know we we uh, were there uh, for operational area on dongwa 53 battalion uh our job was to do escorts for for um sometimes you would get um, uh, the school children arrived because school children uh, they used to go to school in Grootfontein in those days and when for vacations they would fly back to Ondangwa and then we had to escort them back to Oshakati where their um, parents lived then um, uh, you know it so happened um, on uh, a particular day that uh, I had two sections that had to escort the school kids back. It was December back to back to Oshakati. And they they got onto two uh, buffels and they escorted the the kids normally rode in hippos uh, because it was more protected for them. And um on the way back, just between just before they reached the efforts, because it was you got the Air Force Base, and then 53 Battalion was just after the Air Force Base. Um, the two buffles escorting the school kids after they already safely dropped them off. When they came back, they drove into an ambush. Um, and we got a um, message at our uh, base that our two uh, buffles drove into an ambush, and there are several casualties. Um, uh, I rushed to the to the sick bay, and there, um, you know, I basically saw my troops. Basically, I had, I uh, found um, my troops that basically escorted the school kids back to Oshakati. They were all on the tables there, uh, bleeding. Some of them really with uh, very serious wounds, and um, uh, you know. At that stage, many of them needed blood, and we, we 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 were asked to to donate blood. Some of us just had to um, just get onto beds there and directly donate blood to the people that needed blood because some of them were just bleeding profusely. Um, so, you know, the they, the doctors helped the guys, and I think the doctors did an excellent job. Um, they, they managed to, to pull most of them through. I think many of, the, of the, the troops got permanent scars. I mean, it's, it's obvious that's, that that will happen. Uh, permanent scars of, of that particular um, incident. I remember a, a certain uh, Corporal Brooks, he got a, a, a hit in the head and a part of his skull basically um, you know, was removed and um, he 
Um, he got it terribly wounded. And I remember, you know, upon returning uh, back to South Africa and visiting the troops um, at one military hospital, you know, the feeling to see your troops there, you know, and some of them have, have taken really a month to recover. But um, uh, fortunately, I think most of them um, recovered well. Uh, emotional, you know, you, you never know how guys uh, recover because in those days, um, the army didn't um, spend a lot of time, um, I would say, is it the word desensitizing or whatever. As Afterwards, we arrived back and you just had to survive. Um, as, as soldiers, you were just expected to be strong enough. I cannot remember that we ever had psychologists or, or people, you know, taking care of any emotional problems that we may have had. Not um, personally, I have to say, I'm fortunate that it never really bothered me. Although the, the thoughts of, of um, comrades and what happened to them will always be there. It fortunately never caused any uh, bad um, uh, problems in my life that, that, that caused permanent problems. Of course, you'll never forget it. But I know for, for some people, maybe more than others, um, you know, seeing those guys and, um, 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 you know, even see, meeting the families afterwards, um, those were, I think, I think those were the most difficult things for um, us as officers and even at times when you even had to go and visit the next of kin and you had to basically go with the Dumini and knock on a door and announce that a person and I had to do that uh, a few times as well. Those were some of the most, um, I would say, terrible experiences we had because, you know, the moment you knock on a door and you stand there with a the Dumini and you see the face of a father and mother, and immediately they expect the worst when they when they see that. And you know, there were a couple of times when we had to do that. It wasn't a pleasant experience. And you know, even after that, the military funerals were with such a lot of uh, emotion. You know, um, doing a military funeral, um, a military funeral is 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 just it's a beautiful parade to honor as. Uh, a, 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 I don't want to say comrade because people don't like it, but a, a friend that that died in the operational area, giving the highest that you could possibly give. Um, it, it was something something really special. Um, but anyway, um, we we had a few troops there that got really injured. Um, I want to mention another. Um, just another incident there. Uh, one of my platoon commanders, uh, a certain uh, Lieutenant um, De Villiers, uh, we always used to call him De Duffy because he's a little plumpy guy. He used to play forward, uh, prop forward. Uh, he was a he was a really plump. Uh, uh, he was a, a fresh baliki, if I can say in Afrikaans. He was a Bursian, you know. And um, one one day, um, just before, a week or so before, two weeks before we were due to return back to, to South Africa, um, I went, I left the tent for an order group with an uh, officer commanding. And the moment I left, he was like hanging on the, it was like a tent steel, the steel wires that, you know, we used to uh, keep the tents up. And he was like hanging on the tent there and he said, Munda, Lieutenant, Munda. I said, yes, um, soon we were going home. And had I only knew, you know, then that they, those were his last words. When we walked into having the order group, there was a heavy thunderstorm happening at that moment. Um, lightning hit the tent and he was like at that moment while he was like hanging onto the steel cable he was like struck by lightning and um, he he was he was dead on the scene um, he was immediately taken to the sick bay and um, there was also a doctor de Villiers in the sick bay 
trying to resuscitate him, giving him a hot massage. And only the two of us um, were there at that stage. And I was, you know, looking at this young officer ready to, to actually um, leave army service and to become, because his father was a very famous Bonsmara uh, cattle farmer in the Freiburg area, Northern Cape. He was ready actually to take over the farm. And there he was dead on the, on the table. And um, while this doctor De Villiers was trying to, you know, his very best to give this guy a heart massage, it just didn't succeed. And I will never forget, you know, the moment he took out the body bag and we had to put this a fellow soldier back into a body bag, you know, and two weeks before returning back to the States, as we used to call it, and he was dead. It was a, a very, very hard blow for us um, when that happened. But that was part of army life, you know, and um, uh, we, um, we returned um, back to, to South Africa in uh, December of... Um, uh, nine, uh, 1980. Then um, I, uh, well, earlier I already got the news that I was transferred to um, uh, one SACC battalion, which is the, the Cape Corps battalion in East River at that stage. Um, so from January 1981, I effectively uh, was transferred there. Um, this was my, um, you know, I grew up in the old South Africa, I uh, have to say, and um, uh, although I'd never had a, a real big problem with apartheid as such, we, we, we just, I mean, as you know, we grew up that way. I mean, we didn't ask for that. That was the system in which we grew up. And um, at that stage, being with, um, people of other races was just in the beginning stages. We were not used to that. Um, and it was for me uh, a, a unique experience to be transferred there. Um, uh, but my uh, previous friend, I would say Michael Delport, who was, um, who was one, he was uh, uh, my fellow officer which we, when we deployed in Rhodesia, he was then the director infantry who was working in, uh, in Pretoria and he, he played a role in um, uh, getting me there. Uh, actually, it was nice going to Cape Town. I mean, I, I, uh, I uh, never lived there and it was a new experience for me. But that was my first experience to work with, with um, soldiers of, of other races, so to speak. And funnily enough, uh, for me, you know, when I walked in there the very first day, um, who will I meet? The first officer that I, uh, or the first person of rank that I meet was uh, Corporal Fritz with the same name, surname as I had. So um, then, um, you know, um, I got used to, to working with the guys. They were a unique bunch of, you know, there are so many stories about them. Very, very special people to work with. Um, so I walked in there and the, my officer commanding was uh, then um, Commandant um, Valise Tradon, also an ex-paratrooper, um, um, military academy, very professional officer. He used to be uh, also an officer of, uh, come, coming from, those days they had a 2-1 battalion in Lenz. There was a black battalion in Lenz. But he worked there before, and then uh, he was transferred, and he was an officer commanding. He, he took the first colored Cape Corps battalion, and he was an officer commanding there. Um, and the two I see then was Brian Adams, whom you probably also had on your show. Brian Adams, um, he then later became the officer commanding of 201 battalion, and later um, uh, group... I also saw his program that you had on, on, on Legacy. Great uh, officer, great guy. 
uh, Englishman. He was um he was an Englishman there in the you know all of us were Afrikaans speaking and um, uh, he had to survive among us uh, Afrikaans speaking ones. But anyway, uh, there I was uh, at this unit with Commandant uh, Veristradom and um, RSM Eddie Sykes. I don't know if you've heard about him. He was also a very uh, famous, infamous, whatever you want to call He was a, a unique guy, uh, very thin, very regimental, but with his very special way. When he talks to somebody, he would like, troop. He, and then the troop will just disappear because, you know, he, he would he would um, know something is coming his way. But, but he was a very special Eddie Sykes. He later went on to become the sergeant major of the army. Um, and he retired as a very, very uh, high rank uh, sergeant major. Um, uh, I just heard later, very respecting, very respected uh, person um, that spent his whole life. He... In, you know, in the early days, they had uh, uh, before they had the S one SSCC battalion. They call it the the SA Service Battalion. It, it first had another name before they call it SA Cape Corps Battalion. But um, anyway, he was the first RSM, a very very special guy. Uh, you know, he was in his special way. He could tell an officer when an officer was not doing something right. He could tell an officer in the right way to behave in the right way. So, I mean, even as officers, as young officers, we were scared of him because he was a, he was a tough, <laughs> tough RSM, but uh, a very special guy and a unique guy uh, to work with. Then um, I became a, a, a company commander. We, we were given three companies um, as national you know that those those days the the the, the, the colored guys were um, uh, um what is a frivolous now anyway they they chose to volunteer to volunteer they volunteered to um to come uh, to uh, to the army and uh, there were lots of them coming and we 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 trained them. At that stage, we had uh, there were three units: one SSC battalion, SSCC battalion. Then there was the Cape Core School, and then there was the um, uh, SACC maintenance unit. These three units, um, Eerste River area, Fora area. So um, we uh, then um, trained during that year and. Um, uh, we gave the kids, oh, the, the, the students, all the, 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 the training, the troops, all the training that they were supposed to undergo, getting ready to um, deploy operationally. Because in, in those days, all units had to deploy operationally. So uh, we trained them, you know, put them through basic training and uh, all the different kinds of, of trainings that they had to undergo. And um, funny, you know, just a funny thing, uh, for the first time, I experienced all the strange surnames of the of the troops. You had like all the months of the year from January, February, March, and you had uh, Siqui, and you had Olifant, and you had um, all <laughs> very, very funny. But, um, uh, you know, I got used to it and uh, really got to uh, love this bunch of troops. They, they were unique, especially their singing. I mean, their singing was unlike anything else you could ever experience from, from any other uh, uh, battalion. Um, when they were like running from place to place with their rifles and singing, those the singing, you know, really made you feel that they had their special uh, songs that they sang. Very, very, very unique. But anyway, we, um, we did out the, the training. Um, I had a uh, few national servicemen um, officers from infantry school. And then I also had two officers um, that qualified through the, they, they had the uh, Cape Core school where they trained their own officers at that stage. They didn't send their officers to infantry school at that stage. So we had uh, a certain Lieutenant Goliath 
and David, if I remember correctly, joining my company. And um, as uh, uh, two IC, I had um, uh, a Lieutenant Basson, which uh, was a sergeant at infantry school, but he did infantry or officer scores and he became uh, an officer. Uh, fresh from infantry school, he was my second in command. And we um, uh, trained the company. And uh, by the time we were ready in September, we were deployed to uh, Sector 20, Kavango, uh, the Rundu area. So um, once again, as is, is the case, we, um, we did uh, uh, retraining first. And um, then my company was basically deployed to an area uh, in the, I would say, Kavango, Western Caprivi area. I mean, I think you are familiar with that area, but you get the Kwando River. You get the Kwando River and you get Kavango and you get the Caprivi, which basically border uh, each other. So my company was then deployed at a base called Bagani. Bagani, which was on basically on the... Um, uh, what was that river? The Kabongo River. Actually, the Kabongo River flew from Angola into Botswana. That's one of the rivers that actually do not flow to the sea. It basically ends up in the Kabongo swamps, whatever, swamps. Um, so we were based there, and um, I had to basically send my platoons in different platoon, to different platoon bases. One platoon was deployed uh, on the Kwando Bridge. Another one was deployed in uh, Kurukuru, was another bronze, uh, platoon base. And another one was deployed uh, at Tondoro, which was another platoon base. And we then had to man the uh, Bagani Bridge. Now, Bagani, Bagani was very near to 3-2 Battalion Buffalo their base, and also Umiecha. So when you take basically the road, which basically when you take the road to, to Caprivi, basically on your left side, you would find um, Umiecha, which was the Bushman Battalion, and on the right side, you would find um, Buffalo, uh, more to the river, which was the Buffalo base at that stage. So I was based there, and there the um, base commander was a certain... Uh, Commandant Badenors, um, he was the area commander of that area. Um, but he was like a wolf, you know, uh, oldest guy. And uh, he had his own airplane. Um, for the first time, uh, you know, one day he mentioned to me, he said, Johan, we have to go and have an order group in Rundu. I said, okay, um, let's go. Uh, he said, no, we fly. I said, how? He said, I have my own airplane. I said, okay. And then... <laughs> He pulled out his airplane from the, um, the store there, and it was like a little two-seat Cessna. And for me, that was a first, you know. Um, we had to fly to, um, to Rundu to attend the uh, uh, officer commanding orders meeting there. And um, I was looking at the Cessna, and I was very comfortable. You know, these small airplanes, you know, it's just the, the one little... Uh, rotor there, whatever in the front, and uh, they just don't look very uh, kosher for me. Uh, they're not sturdy enough for me to, to fly. But anyway, I got in, and um, he was flying. But you know, because there in the north, you get um, they, they call it air pockets. You know, when especially in the midday, the airplane will f fly, and then suddenly it will just fall for like a few meters. And um, this, this Cessna was, he was flying and this airplane was like hitting air pockets, the one and the, after the other. And I was starting to feel, my goodness, I'm not going to make it. Um, and I was sitting next to this guy and I was thinking, today is my, I'll take anything else, but flying in a small aircraft wasn't for me. And eventually, you know, we landed uh, safely. And uh, I mean, obviously he was used to it. It wasn't, for him, it wasn't something unusual. We landed, we attended uh, the, the meeting and everything, and then we had to fly back, and um, I, I very seriously was thinking to just go back by 
by uh, Land Rover or by any other means. I didn't want to fly back, but it, eventually he just he just convinced me to um, to fly back um, with him. And uh, the flying back was not that difficult because I think it was later in the evening. It cooled down a little, so there there weren't so many air pockets as you know you'll find in midday. So it it was um, much better. Um, then, of course, um, at that stage, um, I came to a sort of a decision in my life and I decided to resign from uh, the Defence Force. I, I also must mention, October, just before I was deployed, um, I was promoted to captain um, by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Commandant Billy Stradom. And um, I think he's... You know, he saw some potential in me and um, he really he thought that, you know, uh, I was going to be a career officer, which I, which I was. I, I wanted to be in the army. But at that stage, um, the long times away from home started to sort of be a little bit heavy on me. And um, I was um, away from home a lot. And I, uh, I decided to, to resign from, from the army at the end of... Um, 1981. Um, I left the army and um, I joined Sunlam. I worked at Sunlam headquarters in Belleville for, for uh, a few months. Um, it, was, it was very difficult for me because, you know, to become a SEBI after you've been in the army is very, very difficult. It was very hard for me, and um, I, I often regretted my decision. I uh, left Sunlam after a few months, and I worked for a security uh, company because those days security companies, uh, even now, they're very big in South Africa because there are a lot of national key points to protect. And I joined a security company as a sort of a chief training officer, or whatever, and. Um, then I uh, uh, joined them and I was responsible for training the security officers. But lo and behold, um, very soon after I left the army, I got my papers. You have to do citizen force now because you haven't completed enough years. You have to join citizen force. And there I was, um, uh, you know, to become part of the Cape Town Rifles. Um, situated in Weinberg in Cape Town, they were called the Cape Town the Duke's Rifles. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but a very, you know, you had you had these two uh, um, units, the Cape Town Highlanders and the Cape Town Rifles, very regimental, very uh, strong in their traditions. They had their officers' messes with all their because. You know, many of them were involved in the Second World War, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So they had a very rich tradition. And suddenly I found myself, my goodness, I left the army because I spent too much time away and um, I had to attend weekly meetings with them again. Yet I was back. And um, it wasn't long um, before they mentioned, listen, we, had to, we have to send a company to the operational area, back to... Um, Ondangwa again. There, um, he said, you, you're a captain, you just come from the Defence Force. Um, we will, uh, you will uh, take this company up to the, the border area. And um, uh, got the company together and there was a, a major in charge. Uh, I, uh, for the moment, I just forgot his name. But anyway, he was in charge. I was the company to I see then. And, um, but he was just only to take the company up for a uh, initial two weeks. And then I had to take the company over after that. So we got the company together. I mean, all these troops from their civilian jobs got together in, a, in an area called Wingfield, um, in Cape Town area. We did training there and, um, got our equipment, everything, and eventually uh, from Plot we departed for um, for the operational area. Uh, did our normal retraining at Oshibello, and uh, then left for, uh, again, 5-3 Battalion. Um, 
This time at 5-3 Battalion, the officer commanding there was Commandant Don Nell, um, very, very strict officer. And um, now I found myself as a sort of a civilian force member, a little bit strange because I come from the permanent force and I knew the sort of a, the little uh, sort of attitude of, you know, there was this, they always called them the compers, the campers, uh, you know, <laughs> because they were not full-time soldiers. They came and they just did their camps for eight years and then they just returned. And many of them, you know, they didn't have lots of, um, you know, uh, they were just like very laid back. And for them, it was just, many of them, it was just like a vacation. Many of them were quite good. I mean, great soldiers too, I have to say. But um, you can imagine, you know, many of them, family people taken away from their families, now suddenly, and even some of their jobs stopped to pay them. You, you just had to do your, your camps. And um, here we left and we uh, arrived. Um, and um, there I was at 5-3 Battalion. Uh, and within two weeks, the, uh, the major left back and uh, I was a captain in, in charge of this company. And um, one of my um, platoons were divided or um, sent to the Air Force Base for Dongwa. They were responsible for Air Force Base um, uh, security, manning the gates and, and you know, um, whatever uh, tasks. Um, and um, I was then with my, the rest of my company, I was at 5-3 Battalion. Then um, at some stage, we um, we were deployed. Uh, we got an instruction to to deploy into uh, Angola, to uh, to go into Angola and form stopper groups, because there was going to be a sweep operation taking place um, by another uh, uh, group, and we had to form stopper groups and to stop any any of the swap terrorists to to uh, flee north. So there we were um, uh, at our base or, or our, in our positions and um, um, sitting there one morning just after, uh, during the day after just, you know, busy with our normal uh, routine in the temporary base. And as I was sitting with my back to a tree here to um, Fopla, uh, Soldiers came running, basically, like fifty meters from me. They came running straight toward me, and uh, you know, <laughs> your instinct is just you basically grab your your rifle and and uh, you shoot. And the rest of of the people near me just uh, quickly got their guns or their rifles, not their guns. We never we were never supposed to pull their guns, but the uh, rifles, and they started to shoot and. We had these two guys um, with the AK-47s, and um, they were instantly uh, killed with lots of, uh, you know, uh, bullets through them. And um, minutes later, um, uh, vehicles arrived of the people responsible for the sweep operation because they were basically chasing them, and they chased them right into us. And, um, you know, they were just, uh, you know, eliminated very, very quickly. With these, I cannot remember if it was um, the local Ivombo battalion or 201 battalion or which battalion. But anyway, when they arrived in the vehicles, they just looked down on the bodies. And with absolute, you know, those were like, there was like a, a, a very, I cannot describe the hate they had for these terrorists. These guys were even in their vehicles looking down and some of them took their rifles and they shot a few more shots just into these bodies that were already there dead. And um, then they just left um, uh, and uh, we, we, we basically reported, uh, you know, the, the incident to our base and um, at some stage, they they uh, they used to pick up the bodies and used to identify certain 
prominent uh, swap interest in, in, in the area. But in this particular case, they um, then just let us know, just bury them there. Um, but they only let us know the next day. So we had a whole night there with these uh, bodies. Um, I know it sounds a little bit gross, but anyway, um, uh, we basically emptied their pockets and took their all their possessions and, and buried them and just, you know, took everything uh, away with us. Um, but of course, for, for us, you know, as many people have said in the past, you know, in, in a war situation, it's, it's your life or another person's life. What do you do? You know, um, if you don't uh, kill, you, you are the one that gets killed. And that is what we did. Um, and many people would often um, ask you, um, but how do you feel about that? Uh, and I find it hard to answer the question because it's not actually a feeling. It's a feeling of instinct. That's what you do. You trained for that, you do it, and you don't regret it afterwards because that is what you were trained for. All your life, you trained for that, and that is what you do. I mean, uh, we had like limited um, contacts compared to many of the other guys, but those were the, uh, the, the you know, the, the contacts we had. So then um, we, we uh, went back, this company, and... Um, we were very happy that um, you know we we got these those days. The the different battalions were competing, getting heads, and we it's actually uh, it's it's maybe strange to say, it, but we had our boards on which companies got the most heads. That's what that's how it happened those days. Uh, we were actually having competitions. Um, and, you know, getting getting hit, and um, that's how it worked. And there were even trophies given for, for for companies that were the most successful. It was a war for us, and and, and that was it. Anyway, um, uh, this company um, we then returned um, back to South Africa, and because then um, I I realized I wasn't happy uh, to be a citizen force member, and I realized that I, I was going to do this for several years to complete my camps. I, I went back and I, uh, I had a meeting with, with Commandant Veli Stradium at the 1 SCC's battalion then. I said to him, uh, Commandant, I want to come back to uh, rejoin um, the Defence Force. My, I'm a soldier. My, my heart is, is in this. And um, he was very, very helpful. I, he assisted me. Um, I managed to get uh, through us. A quick selection board I had to fly up or uh, to Pretoria for um, psychometric tests and whatever and um, I just got back into the system quickly again um, so I rejoined um, in 1984 in the uh, middle of the year I rejoined the defense force and immediately then um, because the the deadline to apply for the military academy was more or less the middle of the year. And uh, having applied for the military academy before, and I was successful, and then I just, due to some reason I didn't go, I applied again because I, I wanted to go. The military academy was something I wanted to do as an officer. So I, I went for a, a military academy selection, and I was uh, selected. And um, uh, I completed my uh, year as a... Um, as a just a training officer at um, one SCC battalion with Commandant Willis Tradum. And then there was another uh, 2IC, um, Willem Bester. Uh, he was the, the 2IC. Anyway, um, I completed my, um, my uh, time there. And at the end of um, 1984, I had to move to Saldana, um, where the military academy was. So um, I moved there with um, with basically my family. Um, uh, I uh, got a house in Friedenburg. And, um, you know, we had two groups. You, you had the, the married guys, they got houses. And the single guys, they lived in the single quarters um, in the military academy on Mochas Um 
Then I joined as a first year, but uh, I was already a captain at that stage. So I was already um, 26, 27 years old, so a little bit older than your typical other soldiers. Um, but then I joined as a first year, um, uh, the officer commanding at a military academy then was a, a certain uh, brigadier Veli Kotsie from the engineer corps. Um, also went uh, a guy that went through uh, previous operations. Uh, he was quite well known in, in previous operations in into Angola. Um, then, you know, I just enjoyed the student life. Student life was very um, special because suddenly you're a student now, but in uniform, you attend class every day from morning from uh, about eight o'clock until 12 o'clock. Then you go home in the afternoons. You basically study in the evenings. You prepare for tests. And that is basically what you do. You had probably three to four hours class a day. It was actually a wonderful time. I think most officers that went through the military academy would say those were the best days of, 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 of your life. Because especially, you know, we were like uh, next to the West Coast where you uh, basically had all these crayfish meccas where you could go and just enjoy yourself. And I mean, I quickly made friends with people that were very good divers. I never managed to do it myself, I have to say, because uh, you, you, near, you need to be very good to dive for, for crayfish. But anyway, I always had good friends um, doing that. And the best crayfish were the ones where you could go in and dive for them and basically cook them right there on the beach, you know, and had the crayfish there, fresh crayfish, unbelievable. And um, we had lots of, lots of um, times doing that. But the military academy days were wonderful days because we were students on the one hand, but also um, still officers on the other hand. Um, I remember we, we participated in carnival with the University of Stellenbosch because we were uh, the faculty of military science as the Faculty of Military Science of the University of Stellenbosch, we, we were actually seen as a, a, a group. And every year we linked up with one of the, the girls' dormitories and we did carnival with them. And of course, uh, we always won because you can imagine now, as officers, I mean, we came from backgrounds where we you know, had skills that the normal students didn't have. So when it came to building floats, the girls' dormitories, they always wanted to group with us because our floats were always the winners. So we were um, just all over the, the, um, the, the, the other students because they, they could never participate with us. But anyway, we, we had nice excursions to Stellenbosch because the main libraries were there and um, uh, lots of the student uh, life took place there. So we, we often traveled uh, to Stellenbosch. But... Um, Life on the West Coast was, was really wonderful. Um, I uh, enjoyed it, and I fondly remember life in the military academy as one or the three year, best years of my life, as, as many of the officers would say. Um, you know, you basically study and, um, uh, and write tests, and during recess periods, which happened um, every year, July and December, you would typically go and serve at your unit, or you would go and do a course at, at infantry school or uh, you would deploy. Um, as uh, I think Franz Fourier also mentioned, um, he normally those times Franz always went up and he deployed into um, you know Angola and uh, into special operations. So um, the three years uh, military academy, yes, um, wonderful years. I, I um, got to know um, many good friends there. I think what made the military academy unique is you that's your first exposure to to uh officers from all the different you know the navy and the uh, medical and the uh, air force so all of us became uh, uh, a very close uh, unit and um of course we had to study here and there too because that's what it was supposed to be uh, but 
it was a, a very special opportunity to be able to study and to be paid your normal salary and to uh, get a degree. So um, as officers, we normally had to, uh, we had three choices. You could do a, a BA, a BSc, or a BCom. Uh, but the degree was known as a BMIL, military science, uh, issued by the uh, University of Stellenbosch. So um, I um, decided to do a, a BCom. For me, it was something that I felt I could use in later years. Um, and uh, of course, I wasn't strong at math because the BSc guys had to do math. And the BA guys did more of military science. And um, that is something that I, I have one regret now, when I, especially when I listen to you sometimes. You're a, a person that is highly knowledgeable in military science. I often thought that I should have used the opportunity at the military academy to, to study military science and to learn about military history more because, um, you know, our course was totally just um, economically based. We did economics, business economics, industrial psychology, um, uh, corporate law and those kind of things. Nothing, nothing with regards to um, military science at all. Um, so eventually um, I graduated and my main subjects were um, industrial psychology, economics, and um, industri uh, uh, business economics. Yes, three subjects. So um, at the end of uh, 1987, um, we graduated the military academy and um, I was then transferred to to SACC Battalion, which was a newly formed Cape Corps Battalion. It was then um, one year old. Um, it was first established by uh, Commandant Dion Falk and uh, RSM Yapi Kibido at that stage. So then when I was transferred there, that was uh, exactly the time when Saki Mare was transferred there. He was a major. Uh, he was transferred. So both of us arrived at the unit. I was a major. I was transferred in as a 2IC. And Saki Mare was transferred in as a major to become a commandant from January of 1988. So um, I arrived there. And um, my first uh, time working with a parabat, um, Saki Mare was a a very special and unique person to work with. And as you said at the beginning, there was only one Saki Mare in, in the, he's a, a legend in the Defence Force. Everybody knows him. He was a, the RSM there and he made a name for himself, uh, everybody. The name Saki Mare, um, I think, caused fear among many paratroopers and um, all the people that worked with him fondly remember him as a as a very special guy who was a uh, he was the he was the perfect example of a soldier in all respects he was he was a soldier out and out when he became an officer he was an absolute professional officer he was um very very professional i learned a lot from him he was a was a great guy um so as his second in command he he was the commander of the base, um, and but a second in command, the second in command of a company of a the battalion, was uh, responsible for the training. So um, I took charge of training, where he took part. Uh, he took charge of the, the the management side of the base. So at that stage, we took over the then Cape Core. The Cape Core unit was then disbanded. Um, it no longer existed. Because at that stage, all officer training, everything, uh, you know, were done at infantry school, as was the case. Um, it should be. So we took over uh, new buildings and headquarters, everything, new offices, everything. And um, uh, we had our new intakes of, of, of soldiers. Um, and our uh, sergeant major was sergeant major Yopi Kipido. Um, he was... Um, the son of um, Commandant Kipido, which was one of the, the um, 
founding members of this, I think they call it the this, they used to call it the service battalion in those years, the first, the early days of the the the, the, the colored battalion. He was one of the founding members. So uh, Yapi was uh, the, the, the RSM and um, with Sakumari, the, the officer commanding, and we we um, managed the, the battalion. Um, of course, Sakimare is a fitness maniac, if you can call it that way. Running was like into his blood, and um, I had to adjust very, very quickly because he would just he would tell, tell me very, very quickly, Johan, you need to have your running gear ready every day. So um, he would just, uh, on any given day, he would just say, RSM, come here, take us out and drop us off 10 kilometers from base. And we run back, you know, the parabas, they were just like that. They, they, they run, they were extremely fit. And Saki Mare was, he was just, he was a, a natural uh, fitness fanatic. He always uh, ran and, um, and I, I had to keep up with him always. Um, he was a very funny guy. Uh, Saki Mare, he had a very um, unique sense of humor. Um, I remember um, often, you know, the two of us had to do, um, you know, in the army, you have a, like what you call a summary trial. When you have minor offenses, you have, you do like uh, take care of my, minor offenses. When uh, staff members transgress, you have to do it yourself. So um, in, on many occasions, he was the, the trial officer and I was the prosecutor. So then you basically, you have the, the RSM, he would march in the, 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 the person um, who transgressed and then Saki, uh, Saki Mare would be the, the officer in charge and then I would be the prosecutor and I would bring the charge against him. And um, then, you know, it's normally just like uh, whatever punishment you get, DB or detention or whatever be the case. Um, I remember one incident where uh, there was a corporal, who, uh, a permanent force corporal who got drunk on duty. He um, he stole a bottle of very expensive whiskey and he got drunk on duty. So um, uh, Saki Mare and I, we had to do this trial. And um, when, it, when it came to before he sentenced him, he just said, um, this court will take into consideration that you got drunk on a very, very expensive whiskey. So that will be taken into consideration before we <laughs> before we decide on the on what the penalty was going to be. So it was even it was always like a tongue in the cheek, very um uh, special um way in which he dealt with with the with the troops. Another occasion I can remember when um there was a, another one, a troop on trial. And there was always like, you know, you would read the charge and then uh, you would ask, so what do you plead? And um, this troop was, uh, he, he was about to plead, said, um, guilty with a reason. <laughs> so I always, I always remember that one, you know, when you plead guilty with a reason, it's always very interesting what the reason was because actually, he didn't want to take um, blame for what he did because he felt that someone else, um, you know, had to take blame for, for that. But anyway, um, I uh, spent the years with um, with, with Saki Mare. We, we worked together in 1988 and 1999. And uh, the two units, one SACC and two SACC, had a very interesting rivalry, I would say, because Nick Mostert was the officer commanding one SACC and Saki Mare was a commander two SACC. So our two units often competed playing rugby, athletics, everything. And it was like when the two units had sports day, it was like war, you know, because, you know, Saki Mare being a parabat, you know, they don't lose. Parabats don't lose. For them, it is about winning. And winning is, he often, his motto in life was, um, 
winning is not everything. Winning is the only thing. That was Saki Mare's motto. And, um, you know, we, we always had these rugby matches against um, Nick Mostert. And, you know, I was, I was the manager of our rugby team. And Saki was the, he was the motivator. And then Nick Mostert had his team. And every year it was like a, a very uh, important derby that we had when these two units clashed. And it was a big, big occasion with all the troops on the pavilions shouting. So it was, it was big because it was almost a personal issue between these two commanders. Um, and, um, you know, it was like a one year they would win, other year we would win. And not only that, we would also have the, I just must quickly add, um, there was this, um, they had a way of, of recruiting rugby players in very unique ways because your rugby team had to be the best. So, so Saki Mare had a, he had his contacts at the castle and the castle was Western province headquarters. So he had his contacts with, uh, you know, with people allocating troops to different units. And he always managed to get very good rugby players allocated to our unit. Um, or white troops from, uh, from uh, you know, they just finished the university, very excellent rugby players. They joined our unit just to play rugby. So they were given special positions, but Nick Mostert did the same. So the two, company, uh, the two battalion commanders were always in competition, trying to get the best players to play for them. And, um, you know, we had very, very, very special do- days, uh, those, those days. Not only that, we then had um, a boxing nights too. Now, you know, Saki Mare was very, in the parabats, they, boxing is very important for them. So he, that, he also implemented the boxing evenings. So we had boxing contests between us and uh, uh, 1ACC Battalion. And those boxing nights were, were also very, 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 very special. Um, then one thing I w- just want to add, which is also something that was also unique that we had once a year. Um, that's something that Saki Mare brought in. We had a, a music, a special music evening where we would invite top performers from the top performers in the country, which we could find. And then we would invite the uh, Brigadier and high-ranking officers, even the head of the army, you would invite everybody as high as possible to attend these uh, meetings or, or the music evenings. So I remember once we had, um, you know, you remember many years ago we had a singer Anneli van Rooyen. I don't know if you can still remember her. And we had a guy um, uh, playing the um, guitar. Just for a moment, forgot his name now, but he was. Very, very, Trevor Nasser. Trevor Nasser, he was very, very famous those days. And um, we we got all these important uh, popular singers and people. And I had to fly up, meet them. And we had a special um, Air Force plane flying them down. And they came to perform. We, we uh, had a... a a whole theater rented for the, in this Stellenbosch uh, uh, City Hall and had a music evening and then a, a very special meal afterwards. Top, you know, with all the best kind of food that you could possibly have. Now, Saki Mare introduced that and we had a few of those and it was really very, very special. Everybody, you know, dressed in their mess dresses and with high uh, ranking officers and prominent civilian people, uh, even mayors inviting them to to attend. So uh, those were fond memories um, that we had. Then of course, um, finally, um, in the middle of um, 1990, I, um, I came to the conclusion Things were starting to change in South Africa, uh, rapidly changing on the political front. And uh, I was starting to see that 
the future was not going to hold in uh, very much for us white officers. And um, I decided um, to uh, terminate my services uh, at the end of August uh, 90, um, 90, yes, it was 1990. Um, in the meantime, you know, the, the, the few years before that, I continued my studies at UNISA and I um, got an honors in industrial psychology. So um, I felt that I would like to go in this direction a little bit more and, um, you know, become uh, maybe a person in charge of training. And then was my phase that started in the... Uh, private life. I joined uh, an insurance company, uh, Metropolitan Life, at that stage, for which I worked uh, the next, I would say, 11, 12 years of my life, and then got involved in their administration, um, became a, a senior manager at the headquarters in Belville, and um, I became very much stuck in the corporate world uh, and had to travel a lot. Um, and I was away from home again, back into my army days, uh, away from home a lot. And um, uh, I decided uh, that, no, I needed a break. Um, and um, then at some stage, um, my wife and I, were, we were on a vacation in Hong Kong and Singapore. And um, we experienced the the Chinese culture for the first time. And um, we then came to a point in our lives where we decided, let's make a break from South Africa. Let's go uh, somewhere else. And our initial decision was to go to China um, and um, work there. But then a friend of mine told me about uh, a friend of his that worked in Taiwan at that stage. And... Um, Long story short, I uh, decided to come to Taiwan and um, uh, I had a connection here and um, I met up with a, a, a friend in, in, in Taiwan and he introduced me to a school and um, I started to teach English uh, as an English teacher. Now that was at the end of, um, well, at the beginning of 2004. So of course I, um, I, I came to Taiwan and basically moved. I had my, uh, I packed up my houses, everything, I had everything, sold everything, and basically decided to leave South Africa uh, for good um, because things were just not going in the right direction. And the subsequent years actually proved me to, to make a right decision at that stage. Um, so I came to Taiwan and um, over the years I became a, a an English teacher, and I enjoyed doing it. Um, English teaching is a big business in Taiwan. Um, all parents want their kids to learn English. It is For them, it's the way to, to open the world for you. So there are a lot of English schools everywhere, uh, and they pay good salaries for foreigners. And um, the cost of living in Taiwan is, is fairly cheap. Uh, a little bit more expensive than uh, Thailand, I would say, but um, not that much. Uh, maybe slightly more expensive. But um, I came to Taiwan in uh, at the end of January 2004, found a school, worked at a school, and um, during the next number of years, I um, worked here and I learned to to um, love uh, my new country. Um, but I have to add immediately, you know, um, having been a, a South African, you can never find any other place that can become your home. So the missing of the South African sunset in the bush field, the West Coast, there's, there's nothing like that in the world. You can go wherever you want to, um, in Taiwan, we have everything. Technology is great here. It's a safe country. I can go anywhere at night without having, you know, a fear of, of anything. 
but the miss for your home country is always there. So um, I, uh, I still have a house in Cape Town, um, which I at some stage um, have to sell because I'm not sure that I will ever return in a, a permanent way. But then again, um, you know, I'm in Taiwan. I have permanent residency here. I don't have to apply for visas or anything anymore. I, I am entitled to, to stay here for the rest of my life with, and I can work wherever I want to. So um, I'm also approaching the stage in my life where um, I have to sort of calm down a little because going to school every day and teach, teaching kids from nine in the morning till six o'clock at night, you know, it takes, it takes something, um, uh, especially kids are naughty at that age. Um, and um, the older you get, the, you sort of lose patience. I think many of my former colleagues in the army will say, Johan, an ex uh, army officer training kids, the two do not sort of add up. But anyway, um, I had to change. I had to adjust a lot. I had to sort of, um, change my way of thinking and I became used to it and I started to enjoy imparting knowledge to kids and I I think I became good at it over the years um, so uh, to such an extent that I've been working at the same school now for the past 15 years so um, I'm used to the school I I'm used to the um, area where I work um, I'm used to the food um, so um, this is where I see my my uh, my future. Of course, you know there's the forever the China sword having uh, ha hanging over Taiwan, um, where there's always talk of China will attack Taiwan. But that is something that we have to live with. It's it's been here since I came here, and um, I just you know everyone always asks you, are you not worried about it? Uh, you know, you cannot worry your whole life. You have to live your life and you just continue. So, of course, I'm going to stop it there. That's um, my life story, um, where I am now. Um, um, please feel free if there are any questions that you would uh, like to ask. Um, please, uh, you can be most welcome to do that now. Yeah, thank you. I was also sorry for the rest of you listening here. This was fascinating. And uh, if you have questions, of course, you can leave it here below because I think the man's going to come back. There's a lot more stories about him. I was just corralling him into time limits here because our uh, computers can only handle a certain amount of videos and then we have to upgrade and cost a lot of money and then we burn out computers and that costs money. But just to make a few remarks here is that in the old police, only officers were entitled to their monkey suits, not the rest of us, who, of course, I was never an officer. And uh, you had to be a lieutenant colonel before your car could have air conditioning in it. That oh. was how it was in those days, my man. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, and then uh, Trevor Nasser, the guitar player, is actually a, a good friend of a friend of mine who was on the show, Anita also. Anita... Um, else and she's in interviewing him as well as soon as we can oh. get out of the old guy because he fell yesterday and he injured himself a bit uh, but a wonderful man so we're going to get him on because he did his national service right so he's entitled to be on 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 legacy yeah and no he, he, Nasser, he was a legend yeah he still is he's a fantastic guitar player those guys of you who don't know who we're talking about research him a bit on youtube the man was yeah. his five star he made the song for Absolutely. five star with it. Yeah, it's fantastic. That, that was the very famous, yeah. yes. And then it's a funny thing about legacy is that you don't know how big the guys are who you talk to because you just see a little screen, you know. And then sometimes you meet these guys and some of them are skinny little, almost said a word there, but others are big mowers. They, they, they're quite big. And, and Nick Boster is. is a big guy. Nick Boster is a big guy, bigger yeah. than me. And Maybe. he told me a story that Uncle Boris, the Special Forces General, attacked him once during a game. Or he attacked Boris. It depends on who you're talking to. But apparently there was quite a nice first fight between them. And they were on the same team. And that's the most amazing thing. And Nick Mosser was a he was a very good athlete, 
during his days. I remember when we were together at Freeside, um, he was a, a 400 meter specialist. He used to, you know, um, show his half skin for many, many troops. And he was also a very good uh, rugby player. He was, I mean, he's, he's a well built uh, guy. Um, uh, so he is big, I know. I mean, I've I've worked with Nick for for a number of years. He's a big guy, and um, uh, and also uh, the Boris Borman. Um, it's a pretty. Uh, I'm Tony Borman. You never got him on your show because he's the brother of Boris Borman, and um, I think he also has such a lot of things to to tell. And you know, um, the people from the Coloured Core. Uh, RSM Sykes, he's a must have. You must get him on the show. I'm telling you, Chris, he's gonna he's gonna really bring so many things to the show. So if you can, I believe he's still alive and well living in Pretoria. So um if you can, um please try and, and even many of the, the guys from the Color Pool, you know, they have a unique the unique there's something special about the the Cape Core, uh their singing and uh, their way of the humor that they brought to the army. I mean, many people mentioned that, but working with them was uh, was something special. Um, uh, you know, they uh, they uh, lived in different circumstances. Our white guys, we were called up. Many of them volunteered. They volunteered. They were willing to to come and you know, many of them gave their lives for 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 uh, the, the country. So I have a uh, huge respect for them. And many of them, um, I remember many of the soldiers, the first soldiers, there was a commandant, uh, Barney Lung's little colonel, uh, Colonel Glenn Jacobs. They were the first soldiers that came out of that group. They were special. There was nothing different. They were very professional soldiers. They did all the courses. They did the staff courses. They were great guys. And um, those years... Working with them were one of the some of the best years in my life. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, the, the the special humor of those guys. I mean, it's it's something that you don't find in uh, among us South Africans. Uh, you know, the white South Africans. They are just so special. No, that's very true. That's very true. And there's even a movie about them, by the way. Back in the eighties, something came out of the name of Yankee. Or Yankee, Yankee Koma is too. Oh, I remember. And Nick said his, his medal was used. Yeah. yeah, it was a great movie, actually. I, I found it on YouTube the other day. Very badly uh, copied and whatever. But because if you guys have a time, have a look at it. Um, and when I just need to tell the overseas people, yeah, we are a few of them. They welcome you. When we speak about colored people, we don't mean black. In the South African view, it's mixed race. So you yeah. might have a black father and a white mother or something like that. And so, but they are a culture of their own. They, they speak Afrikaans at home and they speak a very unique Afrikaans. And they're damn good fighters. You know, there are people who say they were excellent knife fighters as well. They might have been, <laughs> I don't know. Depends on how much they drank. Uh, but all well, in all, in the army, they, they performed well. Would, would you say they, they were actually good soldiers? They were good soldiers. They did their. Um, tasks and responsibilities, they fulfilled their responsibilities as well as the others, you know, and uh, I remember they had a, a, a unique, they had a, a, a drill squad, what did they call them, a precision drill squad, that was ac absolutely unique from anything else, they used to drill with a 303 with a bayonet, and they did these precision drills that you, you, you could not believe um, so they had special skills that they, um, you know, that they brought to uh, the life of soldiers that that were unseen um, before that time. And um, I was really, for me, it was um, it was a special opportunity. Having been transferred to Cape Town and worked with them in Yester River for a number of years, um, I I never regret it. Um, it it played a a very big role in my outlook in life and it changed many of the sort of the the things I had in my past. You know, we grew up in a different way and having um, being exposed, living with them and experiencing life on the border with them, you know, was um, 
was quite <laughs> unique. <laughs> they had their ways of of doing things in a special way, and um, sometimes you could only laugh at them. But uh, special, you talk about the uh, rifleman Shikui and rifleman Olifant, uh, uh, rifleman uh, all kinds of Octobers and Novembers and December. Um, it sometimes lends for for very um, you know special jokes. Uh, but um, we all laugh together and. Uh, yeah, I think what we'll do is we will have a separate episode where we just talk about the Cape Collar guys in the army yeah. and we'll have to talk about their culture and everything. If we can have some of them, guys, there's an open invitation here. Your allowance is welcome, so you can contact me on net when you're in the contact my net. But now, here at the end, I have to ask you the last question I always ask people. Do you have any message you want for somebody who's watching you now or perhaps in the future? Do you have words of wisdom or or any message like that to your former soldiers, your your comrades? You know, Chris, um, I often think about it. Then, when when you when you ask the same question to to um, other guys, I always think, you know, what what is it that uh, what message is that that um, that I would have? And when you think about it, um, the f the first one is to to live your dream and do what you want to do in your life. And um, in those years, you know, as 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 youngsters, we for us it was a natural thing to do. We we had to just do it, and we never even asked questions. But um, I think what I want to leave is that. Do not allow other people to, to shape your life. You decide you, what you want in life and uh, you make the most of your life because in the end, this is a life that you have to live. And, um, you know, to live the life of a soldier, um, it, is, it is such a pity that, that so many of our young people never uh, had that opportunity. But the the life of a soldier and to to have had the ability to live with with a I would call it a band of brothers where we experience things together we lived through hard times and um, the memories that we made are the things that that you always think back to when you become older now when we become older you often reflect back and you wonder if you would do things different. And, you know, of course, when I think back, I would never do things differently. The only thing I would differently, I would, when I left the Defence Force, I shouldn't have done that. Because um, I, was, I was not ready to experience civilian life. I had that longing back for that, the, that camaraderie among soldiers, which you don't find anywhere else. And... Um, the thing I would say that shaped me in my life that forever that nobody can take away from you is the, the, the discipline that we learned in the army. You, you learned a, a way of, of, of doing things that is unlike um, anything else. That is why so many of the soldiers that came out of our area, they they are scattered all over the world and nowadays so many of them are ceos of big companies all over the world just because of the fact that the courses that we were exposed to were of such a high caliber that um, the officers developed management skills that was like unheard of anywhere else and um, that's why there are so many of them that um you know went and worked in iraq and um and even in now, uh, the, the Middle East, um, many, many other countries, even Saki Mare, you know, uh, he used to work in many, many different countries because they were highly sought after people. So the, the caliber of people, the breed that came out in those years, I, I think it's difficult to find them again. But um, for some reason, I think the young guys from today there must be a longing for something that they missed. And um, I think there should be a time where, where uh, young men should be exposed to some form of, of military training again. 
you know, in Taiwan, I just want to conclude by, by saying that in Taiwan, they have just decided to bring conscription back again. From next year or two years from, from now, they will again have young men to undergo training. Because when you have a young men that are trained, it forms a backbone of your society of people that can face realities in a better way than, you know, the, the I would say young people that are not exposed to some sort of a training where they learn about skills. It equips you for life. It makes you a man. Um, of course, that is, uh, simply put, the army made you a man. And, um, you know, thinking back that as young people, 20 years old, you were expected to lead a company in battle. Um, it, is, it is something unheard of. And the tremendous responsibility and the fact that so many of us came through it and we still managed to have successful lives afterwards. I think that can tell you that the training we went through was some of the best. We were some of the best forces in the world. Uh, I think never to to be repeated. But um, the fond memories among our group will always be there. And I want to thank you in conclusion that you created this um, opportunity for, for, for people like us to share our memories because the things we discussed today uh, are many things that I've never shared to, to many people. And um, it will go out there and people will be able to listen and, and um, relive what we experienced because it's a generation that is over, it will never be again. Um, but it, uh, I just want to say, you know, they, I think there's a book, We Were Soldiers. And um, I want to conclude with that, We Were Soldiers and period. That's what I want to say. Thank you. I think that summarizes everything. And I want to invite the rest of you listening here. Just get hold of me if you want to come and tell your story. You might have to wait a few months, like sadly, uh, Many people do these days, but look, you're welcome, you're all of you. So until we meet again, uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and goodbye.